go back to the first three months of 1993 and compile, using the index terms of the back of current contents, compile the numbers of publications in each of the areas that we're going to be talking about today. And then compared it with the first three months publication rate for 1994. So we have 1993 and 1994. And what we see here with alcohol, ethanol, and alcoholism is in 1993, an average of 250 publications per month were, were written by scientists. In 1994, it went up to 442. So the amount of knowledge that we have about alcohol, ethanol, and alcoholism is growing at least from 1993 to 1994. On nicotine and smoking, which we'll say a little bit about, there were 115 publications in the, uh, per month in 1993 and 160 in 1994. So again, it's going up. And in all the areas that we might be discussing today, caffeine, tranquilizers and benzodiazepines, hypnotics and barbiturates, marijuana, amphetamines and cocaine, and then eating and eating disorders, I just had them include that to see what we knew about that, we're essentially increasing our information from year to year, except in one area, and that's marijuana. Marijuana went from 22 per month to 9 per month, 1993 to 1994. There's a reason for that, and that is that not very many scientists are studying marijuana. It's politically a hot issue, number one. Number two, it's not a real easy drug to study. If you're trying to do marijuana studies in animals, for example, you can't get animals to smoke the stuff. They've actually tried to tape joints on the ends of noses of rats, and those rats will stop breathing rather than to smoke that stuff. They're a lot smarter than humans. <laughs> and then if you take the active ingredient of marijuana, Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, you can't get it into water. It doesn't solubilize. It's, it's an insoluble substance. So they have to solubilize it with alcohol. So if you inject it into an animal, you've got a, what they call a confound to your experiment because you don't know whether it's the alcohol producing the effect or the marijuana producing the effect. So what we're, what we're stuck with then is the marijuana literature is old, old, old. We don't really know too much. Not much is coming out. And all the marijuana literature that I've seen in the past is very, very uh, stigmatized. It either is against the use of marijuana or for the use of marijuana. And I, don't ex I think that's because of the politics associated with it. There's very little mainline, uh, medium, well-controlled, unbiased studies for, on marijuana. Now, you might think that 200 or 442 articles on alcohol, ethanol, and alcoholism per month in 1994 is a lot of information. But it's not because half of those you have to throw out because they're poorly designed experiments. Another quarter of them you throw out because they're mundane types of topics that really don't have any value when you're discussing human pharmacology of alcohol. They might be a, there might be an article in there on the rate of flapping of the fruit fly wings as it's influenced by alcohol. I mean, who cares? You know, that has nothing to do with alcoholism or the effects of alcohol in the body. So it's really not an awful lot of information. And then when you get down to nicotine and smoking, 160 per month, and you do the same thing with that, you see our amount of knowledge is accumulating very, very slowly. The reason for this is that we don't have enough research money for studying addicting drugs. And this afternoon, many questions that you'll ask, I have to say, I don't know, or no one knows, or maybe sometime in the future we'll know that, but we just don't have the money to study that right now. There's an awful lot of practical questions that are brought up by people working with addicted individuals that scientists just have never paid any attention to. Most of the time, scientists don't even know what the disease of alcoholism or the diseases of drug addiction are because they haven't talked to the victims, they haven't talked to the people treating those victims. And when I say victims, I mean victims because these are diseases, and any time you have a disease, you're a victim of that disease. Caffeine, 37 per month. Cocaine has started to go up, 56 to 79. That's because of the war on drugs. The war on drugs has pumped more money into research on cocaine and other drug addictions, but most of the scientists seem to be studying cocaine rather than marijuana or barbiturates or tranquilizers or something like that. This afternoon, you're going to find out that I'm a research pusher. I wish that we had more money to be able to answer a lot of the questions that are involved in the controversial issues associated with addictions. Do you know that the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism annually receives $200 million for studying the causes and better treatments for alcoholism. 
$200 million sounds like a lot, right? But across the nation, that's not very much when you spread it over 1,000 scientists who are studying the effects of alcohol on the body. And to put that into perspective, $200 million is the same amount that our government gives for research on dental disease, gum, gum disease, and cavities. So there's something really out of whack. If you're talking about other drugs of addiction, the National Institute on Drug Abuse gets three times the amount that the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism gets for the study of one drug. National Drug Institute on Drug Abuse has to use that money for the study of all other drugs of addiction. So you can imagine that when you pair it up into the, you uh, pair it up into those other ten drugs or so, major drugs of addiction, there's not much money for the study of any one of those. But there has been a lot of research coming out on cocaine, interestingly enough, so we're starting to learn quite a bit about cocaine. Enough said on that. You'll see as we go throughout the day that uh, it's clear that we just don't have enough research funds. I'll try to keep you awake this afternoon with the interspersement of, in, in my slides of Sniglets. These are words that don't appear in the dictionary by sh but should. They were originated by Rich Hall, a home box office in 1985. And our first one is a cello yellows, people who speed through caution lights. And, and you'll see these placed in there primarily as, as points of demarcation to indicate that we're going to switch topics. So anytime you see one of these, you can expect that we're going to be switching a topic. <clears throat> in Texas, we have a cello reddos also. You're probably aware of this. <laughs> there are some assumptions that I'm going to make to start off with, and, and some people even have trouble with these assumptions, but I don't have time to go into them in a lot of detail. The first one is that alcoholism, and, and we're going to speak more about alcoholism than about other drugs of addiction because we know more about alcoholism than we do about other drugs of addiction. And I'll tell you that the research probably will show that other drug addictions are very similar to alcoholism. And we're going to go into that a little bit when we talk about the brain chemistry associated with this. That'll be neurochemistry 101. It will not be a very advanced level of chemistry. Alcoholism is the same as alcohol addiction, is the same as alcohol dependence. People tend to get confused about these words. Well, is alcohol dependence the same as addiction and, and so forth? So we just tend to use these terms interchangeably. Alcoholism is alcohol addiction is alcohol dependence. It seems very elementary for most of us who've been in this field to say this, but there are still some people who, amazingly enough, are confused with those terms. I'm going to assume that everyone wants to help the victims of alcoholism, and, and that assumption is not so clear when you start to talk to people who don't know anything about alcoholism, because the people who don't know anything about drug addiction say, well, they can just stop anytime they want, so I don't want to help them. It's their, their problem. It's a moral problem. It's a personality problem. It is not a personality problem, as you'll find out. Another assumption is that alcoholism is a brain disease. I don't know where else it could occur except that uh, when I first came to the University of Texas about 15 years ago, there were some people in the Department of Nutrition who said, uh-uh, alcoholism is not up here, it's in here, it's in the stomach. I said, what? I didn't quite understand that. And what they were getting at is those scientists in the Department of Nutrition said that you could cure alcoholism by giving an amino acid that a person was deficient in. And there was a whole department uh, uh, based upon the work of Dr. Williams at the University of Texas at Austin, the whole department that was looking for key amino acids that were, that were able to cure alcoholism. And that's what they meant when they said it's in the stomach, is because if you take in certain types of food, you can cure the disease. We now know that that's not possible. If alcoholism is a brain disease, brain diseases can be understood and treated. A lot of people say, well, we'll never be able to understand alcoholism. It's a special disease because it has spiritual components and it has psychological components and sociological components. Well, I, I like to say that alcoholism is not uh, your, your spouse's fault. It's not found in your attache case or in your kneecap. It's got to be in the brain. And if it's in the brain, we can understand it because we can understand any other organ physiology or anatomy. We can understand the liver, the heart. We should be able to understand the brain just as well. And alcoholism is a disease to conquer, whereas alcohol abuse is a problem to solve. One of my close friends, Dr. Uh, Mr. John O'Neill, has made that statement. It's a very clear statement to indicate that we're dealing with two separate situations here. One is abuse of a drug, and the other is dependence or addiction to a drug. So these are some assumptions, some of which we'll get back to later and explain, but we're, we would like to start out at the same level. Now, the first one has to do with this 
this uh, definition, these definitions that sometimes people get very confused about. Dependency is defined as powerlessness, episodes of loss of control, apparent inability to modify drinking in spite of severe consequences. You probably already recognize that in your handout there are miniaturizations of many of these slides, so you won't have to do a lot of note-taking. You can just kind of sit back and enjoy. On the other hand, I know there are some people who are obsessive compulsive note takers, and uh, I've left space on those uh, pages for you to take notes on the right-hand side if you want to. <clears throat> Dependency is powerlessness. Abuse or misuse is a situation where a person is using by choice, but it is in illegal or unsafe situations or at inappropriate times or places or in cases where use is harmful to oneself or others. Now, the problem, especially in the criminal justice system, is that we can't tell those two apart very well, can we? Uh, when a person is using a large amount of a drug very often, we tend to assume that they're addicted to that drug, but they very well may not be. And it's very important as, with respect to culpability on the part of the individual as to whether you define them as someone who is dependent on a drug that is, has no power over the use of that drug, or is someone who is just using it in a situation where they decide, perhaps in an ignorant way or in an uh, inappropriate way, to use a drug, and then they become aggressive and, and uh, cause some problem. So that could it itself, especially for this audience, be a very controversial issue that we should discuss later, and I'll try to remember to discuss that, because culpability is very important in determining what happens to a person once you make a, de a decision as to whether they're an abuser or dependent. We see two words up here, abuse and misuse. The word abuse is used more in the United States, whereas misuse is used more in, in England and other European countries. And there is a technical difference between those two. I tend to like the word misuse better than abuse, because abuse, if you think of it, alcohol abuse, that's like the, the same as taking a fifth of scotch and throwing it against the wall. You're abusing the alcohol. <laughs> whereas misuse means that you are misusing the drug yourself. So you see, I like the word misuse, but Still, our federal government public publications and our state publications tend to use the word abuse for some strange reason. Do you all understand the theoretical difference between these, these two? Any questions? Okay. We know how to, to take care of abuse, and I'll tell you that in just a moment. But what we don't know very well is how to conquer this pathology of dependence. It's a pathology of the brain. The prevention of alcohol and other drug dependence is pretty generic. Right now, we put all the kids in the gym and we tell them the same thing. You increase your self-esteem, kids. You learn coping skills. You learn to just say no and you'll be all right. Whereas what you should be doing is, for certain kids in the audience, if you know that their mother is an American Indian, and their father is an Irishman, they shouldn't even walk past the liquor store because that suggests that they have a higher risk for becoming dependent than others. Yet we don't do that. We don't ferret out some kids and say, okay, we're going to put you in room two over here and the rest of you will leave in the auditorium. Those of you in room two, because we know you're at higher risk for alcoholism, we're going to give you some, some different skills for preventing uh, pathology. The diagnosis is very subjective. Right now, the physicians don't have any any uh, diagnostic tests where you can take a blood sample and determine whether a person is dependent on a drug or simply abusing a drug. Right now, all we can do is tell whether a person is simply using large quantities of, for this, in this example, alcohol, by looking at their liver enzymes. That gives us some idea as to how much they're using, but it doesn't tell us whether they are dependent or are an abuser. Right now, the best way to diagnose the difference between an abuser and someone who is dependent is to call upon the substance abuse counselors and the social workers who are working in the field, many of whom are in recovery themselves. And so they kind of have the magic handshake when they talk to people. They know what they've gone through. They know whether they're, uh, they have control over the use of their drug or not. Intervention is inconsistent. It seems to me that the best way to get, to get uh, intervened upon these days is that uh, you either commit a second felony in the state of Texas or you are someone who has a, a, a large number of people surrounding them who really love them. So the people who are loved or commit crimes are the ones who get the best intervention and usually find intervention. Those people in between uh, usually don't get any attention. They don't do anything. They don't get any, uh, no one pays attention to them. 
so they don't get intervened upon. Treatment is expensive, time-consuming, marginally effective, and limited in availability, but worth every penny. We could have said the same thing about the treatment of polio 50 years ago, couldn't we? It was expensive, time-consuming, marginally effective, and limited in availability, but it's the best we could do. Same thing with tuberculosis many years ago. We used, I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember the TB sanitariums where we'd place people and put them aside, and it was the best we could do. But until antibiotics came along, uh, it, wasn't very, it wasn't as specific treatment as we need. So today, we're saying the same thing about the treatment of addictions. It's expensive, time-consuming, marginally effective, and limited in availability, but it's the best we can do, and we should be proud of what we're doing. It's the best we can do, but it doesn't mean it's going to be the best 10 years from now. The relapse hate rate is way too high in all drug addictions. It's so high that no one's ever measured it. It's probably too scary to measure. And our folklore is very inaccurate. We intend to clarify some of that this afternoon. We can end the problem of abuse by restricting underage drinking. This is an uh, abuse of alcohol. Restricting underage drinking, reducing the availability, enforcing drunk driving laws, and involving the entire community. Some recent research out of Berkeley Prevention Research Center has shown us that these are the primary ways to reduce abuse of alcohol in a community. The problem is that most communities don't have the political will to do all of this. Some recent studies uh, at Berkeley have indicated in, in one study that they looked at a small city in Southern California, they found that in the inner city, the Mexican-American population was uh, uh, primarily populating the inner city the number of liquor stores in the inner city was 900 in a given neighborhood, whereas in the suburbs where the Mexican-Americans did not live and it was primarily uh, Anglo-white, the density of liquor outlets was 150 in the suburbs. So anytime you have a greater density of liquor outlets, you're going to have greater abuse of the drug. Whereas if you reduce uh, the density, you increase the drinking age, you decrease availability, you raise excise taxes, you're going to get rid of abuse, but you're not going to even affect dependents because dependents, people who are dependent, have to have their drug and they'll find it any way that they can. So we know how to take care of abuse, but we don't know how to take care of dependents. I'd like to use this out-of-control Jeep to indicate that the loss of control is the primary characteristic of addiction or dependency. It's a primary characteristic. A person does not have control over the use of their drug. If you'd like to have just a practical, everyday way of determining whether a spouse of yours or a friend of yours is, uh, is dependent on a particular drug, just ask the question, can that person consistently keep promises to himself or others about the use of their drug? If the answer is no, then chances are they are dependent upon that drug. If they cannot consistently keep promises to themselves or others, then they are probably dependent. That's just a, a rule of thumb. It's not 100%, but it's a fairly easy test. A lot of people come up to me after seminars and say, my husband drinks a case of beer every two days. Do you think he's alcoholic? I, say, I don't know. This is not a too much, too often disease. It's an I can't stop disease. And just because they're drinking a case every two days, I don't know whether they can stop or not. So I'll tell the advice I'll give to the spouse is, why don't you tell him to stop drinking for 10 days and see if he'll do it? If he gives you the answer, oh, of course I can stop drinking for 10 days. I don't have to do that to prove it to you that I'm not an alcoholic. Chances are he's an alcoholic. Or if he says, sure, I can do that, no problem. He gets into five days and says, see, I got five days. Now I proved it. And then he can, starts drinking again. Doesn't do the 10 days. Didn't keep promises to himself or others. Chances are he's an alcoholic. Some people give up drinking for Lent. Are you familiar with that? If, if they give up the drinking for Lent and then they start drinking after Lent again, chances are they're not alcoholic because an alcoholic could not do that. So that's, that's not 100%, but at least it's an indicator. All right? And I know a lot of people who do that. They, they'll either say, I don't have to prove it to you. I'm not an alcoholic because denial is a very important part of this whole process. Okay, now I understand how the drug of addiction is affecting the brain to cause loss of control, also known as impaired control. We have to start at the very basic level of the nerve cell. Now, I could tell by the number of times you raised your hands here today that 
very few of you are experts in neurophysiology. Can I assume that? <clears throat> okay. So what we'll do is we'll start out real simple here and give you uh, the background for where these addicting drugs might be acting in the brain. This slide was given to me by a friend of mine at Scripps Clinic in San Diego, Dr. Floyd Bloom, and he goes out and he talks to people with less scientific literacy than, than this audience about how nerve cells talk to one another. So I'll tell you what he tells these audiences, and then I'm going to show you where a couple of drugs that you might be interested in are working in this particular uh, scheme. This is brain cell number one, and this is brain cell number two down at the bottom. These are also called neurons or nerve cells. In brain cell number one, this is the business end of this cell. And you'll see that right here is at the end of a sending fiber, which starts, it actually arises at the level of a cell body way up above the roof of this building. In the cell body is the chemical machinery for putting together molecules of chemicals that we call neurotransmitters. The, the neurotransmitters are synthesized up in the cell body. They pass down the sending fiber in what look like cellophane envelopes up here. These envelopes are called vesicles. The molecules of the chemicals in the vesicles are dumped into the space between the two nerve cells. This space is called a synapse. The dumping into the synapse is under the influence of calcium. And then these molecules get into the synapse where one of three things can happen to them. Either they are attached to a receptor site, or they are gobbled up by a monster enzyme, never to be seen again, or they are taken back up again into this business end of nerve cell one, repackaged and sent on down the nerve cell for use later on. Inside the nerve cell, there's another enzyme, which is a regulatory enzyme called, in this particular case, MAO, or monamine oxidase. And we see a small ion up in the upper left-hand corner there, which is chloride ion that's necessary for the proper integrity of this vesicle membrane. So you see, in less than a minute and a half, you have a whole course in neurophysiology. That's all you need to know to understand how drugs of addiction act in the brain. Now, let's just take one drug of addiction, cocaine. Cocaine, we know exactly how it works to increase these cells talking to one another, the frequency of, of impulse transmission, as the scientists say, between nerve cell one and nerve cell two. Cocaine blocks this reuptake mechanism here. And you may have read in famous medical journals like USA Today that they have found the receptor site for cocaine in the brain. This is it right there, the reuptake process. It's also known as the dopamine transporter. So when you block the reuptake for dopamine, Dopamine is an excitatory neurotransmitter. More of it appears in the synapse, causing this cell to talk to this cell faster, and that's how cocaine produces the high, when this system is in the part of the brain where we feel the high. So dopamine blocks this reuptake. You get more dopamine. Um, cocaine blocks this reuptake mechanism. You get more dopamine in the synapse. This cell talks to this cell faster, and that's how we get the stimulation. Any questions? All right, now, when a person goes on a run of cocaine, they use it for several days, and then all of a sudden they crash. What happens when they crash is called the cocaine withdrawal symptom. And this cocaine withdrawal is caused by the cocaine running so fast, causing these cells to stimulate one another so fast, that eventually they tend to run out of the dopamine, and therefore the nerve cells can't fire anymore, and the person sleeps for several days. And then we wake up and they're depressed and they have something called anhedonia, which means they can't experience pleasure anymore because they've essentially burned out those neurotransmitters. And they also crave the drug, interestingly enough. And there's a reason that they crave that. We'll tell the, they crave the drug and we'll tell you about that in just a moment. So some scientists then have come to call dopamine the pleasure transmitter when it occurs in the part of the brain that has to do with our experience and our ability to experience pleasure. And you'll get to know this MFB, the medial forebrain bundle, quite a bit in just a moment. This has also led some scientists to come up with a dopamine deficiency hypothesis of anhedonia, which means that not enough dopamine in this pleasure pathway leads to anhedonia, the inability to experience pleasure. It's easy to remember that word anhedonia because the opposite is hedonia or hedonism, and a hedonistic 
uh, a hedon is someone who has an a, a, uh, unfulfilled craving for pleasure. They're always seeking for pleasure and thrills and things like that. So anhedonia is the inability to experience pleasure. Now, there's another drug that works in this system that you might be familiar with. What is the number one prescribed antidepressant drug in the nation today? Do you know? Prozac, right. Prozac or fluoxetine. Some of you may have heard about that. At least it's been written up three times in Newsweek, twice in Time Magazine, and it's in this month's Reader's Digest, in case you're interested. And we're going to talk more about Prozac later because it's causing a great deal of controversy in the psychiatry field right now. We now know exactly how Prozac works to overcome mental depression. And there's depression involved in all of our lives. I'm sure all of you have been at least minimally depressed at some time in your life and was wondering why that occurred. Sometimes minimal depression can be caused simply by a situation, a dog dies or uh, you're in an accident or something like that, that will cause depression. Severe clinical depression is often of unknown cause. We don't know what causes that. But we generally know that the neurochemical mechanism of depression is not enough of a neurotransmitter in the part of the brain where we feel our emotions. And that part of the brain is called the limbic system. Prozac then works to overcome that deficiency of neurotransmitters by increasing the neurotransmitters in here. So Prozac is now known to work right here, the same place that cocaine did, but in a different part of the brain and on a different neurotransmitter, and that neurotransmitter is serotonin. Most of you said you'd heard of serotonin. So Prozac is called an SSRI. a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. It selectively inhibits the reuptake of serotonin here, causing more serotonin in the synapse, and that overcomes the, the, the depression which is caused by not enough serotonin in the synapse. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, some people say, well, that means that uh, Prozac is a lot like cocaine, right? Uh-uh. They both have a basic similar mechanism, but the reason they don't act the same is because Prozac and co cocaine are acting in different parts of the brain and on different neurotransmitters. So please don't think that Prozac is like cocaine. The basic mechanism of blocking this reuptake process is the same, however, but you don't get the same clinical effects. So the SSRIs now are new antidepressants that physicians are starting to prescribe for the treatment of clinical depression. Well, my wife is a pharmacist back in Austin, and she came home one day and she said, Carl, I didn't know there were so many depressed people in Austin. We can't keep Prozac in our pharmacy because physicians are writing so many prescriptions for it. It is known to be a relatively safe drug. It's known to be a relatively effective drug, and therefore, anytime you see that happening with a new drug, physicians are going to be writing large numbers of prescriptions for it because, after all, there are a lot of depressed people out there. And as you're going to find out, Prozac is used for other situations that, in which people just don't feel very good, and they get doctors to write prescriptions for them because they are not feeling so good today, and they want to feel more normal, and they put pressure on the physicians to write prescriptions for Prozac and other SSRIs, such as Zoloft and Paxil and some of these other ones that you may have heard about. Prozac is also prescribed for the treatment of obsessive-compulsive disorders and obesity. Interestingly, obesity. Why obesity? Well, some people who are being treated for depression with Prozac in the past have said, funny, when I'm taking Prozac, I'm not hungry. So physicians have heard this, and they start to write prescriptions for obesity, hoping to reduce the hunger in people and therefore reduce weight. This has led to a new hypothesis called the serotonin deficiency hypothesis of craving. The serotonin deficiency hypothesis of craving should be of interest to, interest to you because $20 million of, of your tax money is going for the s discovery of new drugs which will reduce craving, not only for food, but also for drugs of addiction. These new drugs now are being used as anti-craving drugs to treat cocaine addiction, heroin addiction, alcohol addiction, and other drug addictions. It's the new wave. It's not the magic bullet that's going to correct the brain chemistry problem, but it's a new wave of reducing craving 
thereby reducing relapse and keeping people into treatment longer so that the treatment has a greater chance of sticking. And that's why there's a great deal of interest among the on the part of scientists and the federal government to find new anti-craving drugs. And serotonin is now called the craving transmitter because when it's not and when it's deficient in the brain, it causes people to crave certain things. Is there anyone in here who's never craved anything? Food or chocolate or... Especially susceptible to chocolate. Chocolate, yeah. Chocolate craving is probably due to a deficiency of serotonin. See, what's happening is that neurochemistry is starting to explain a lot of these things that we couldn't explain before. All right, now let's talk a little bit about the neurochemistry of the mesolimbic system. What the heck is the mesolimbic system? That's the part of the brain in which we feel emotions and experience pleasure. So let's show you where it is. The salmon color up here is the brain. This actually is the nose and eye, if you don't recognize that. Nose and eye of a person. The salmon color is the brain, and the colors within the salmon color are the mesolimbic system. These are the parts of the brain where scientists are starting to pinpoint the action of these drugs which give us a high. And you'll notice that there's different subparts of the mesolimbic system. So there's a great deal of research going on right now. Do you know that 80% of what we know about how the brain works, 80% has been found in the last 10 years? But 10 years ago, I couldn't have told you any of this, right? But now neuroscience research is going so fast that it's almost impossible to keep up with. <clears throat> at the base of the brain, you've probably heard of the gland called the pituitary gland. It hangs down at the base of the brain, right smack dab in the middle of the brain. Right above the pituitary gland is a part of the brain that keeps us alive. If any part of that goes out, either with a stroke or because of a car accident or something like that, you're in great threat of not staying alive because there are heartbeat regulation centers in the hypothalamus, there are cardiovascular control centers, respiratory centers, thermoregulatory centers, and so forth. When we're talking about addictions, however, there are five areas that are really important for you to understand that these also occur in the hypothalamus. These centers were found over four decades ago by scientists who placed probes in the brains of animals and stimulated electrically to find out what would happen to the animal. So when they stimulated the water drinking control centers in animals, the animal would drink and drink and drink and drink until they literally blew up like a balloon. Is there any clinical correlate to that with humans, do you know? Perhaps you've heard of the hypervolemic patients who drink gallons of water a day for unexplained reasons. They're not too plentiful, but we often see them in psychiatric centers. The feeding centers, when they stimulated those, the animal would eat and eat and eat until they blew up twice their size. They became tremendously obese. And that's related to obesity in some cases that we see in some people. Now, I'm not saying that in all cases of obesity it's due to overactivity of the feeding center, but at least it's one possible, possible cause of obesity. In the sex centers, when they stimulated, I didn't watch the experiments, but presumably there were little orgies in the cages that went on when they stimulated those sex centers. And we now know that there are sexual disorders. Someone asked me to talk about non-drug addictions. Sexual disorders may be caused by overactivity of the sex centers in the hypothalamus. And all of these centers are real close together, so we'll often see people in drug treatment or substance abuse treatment centers that have substance abuse problems as well as sexual disorders or feeding disorders, eating disorders, something like that. The eating disorders fall into three categories, obesity, anorexia, and bulimia. Perhaps you've heard of all three of those. The pleasure centers, we'll mention in just a moment, and the satiety centers are those which, when stimulated, turn off all the other centers. They send the, con the subconscious message to the, the gray matter saying, you've had enough, you better stop. So when a person eats, a normal person eats so much that they get full, the satiety center kicks in and says, you're no longer hungry. Or when you drink a lot of water, you're no longer thirsty. Or when you had a lot of sex, you're no longer horny. You know, whatever you wanted to call it then. So the satiety centers are very necessary for allowing us to control all of these, these uh, instinctual drives that we have that are necessary for us to stay alive. The pleasure centers are the ones that were made famous by James Oles at the University of Michigan. If you took physiological psychology, you probably remember the intracranial self-stimulation studies of Dr. Oles. He placed the electrodes into primarily rat brains 
and allow the uh, animal to press a lever to stimulate itself. That's called intracranial self-stimulation. And he found that these animals would press 6,000 times an hour, 24 hours a day, day after day, until they literally collapse from fatigue. This is now called intracranial reward. That's a new term, and it's still going on in laboratories today, but with very, very small electrodes, microelectrodes placed into the pleasure center. Now, we can't ask the animals what they're feeling when they do this because they're usually collapsed on the bottom of the cage with a smile on their face, and so they won't answer us. But we know that they, these animals are feeling something that the psychologists call positive reinforcement, something very, very powerful that makes them want to press the lever to get more. Now, there's actually pleasure centers in all of your brains, too. How do we know that? We, do, we don't really have volunteers who will allow us to put electrodes into the pleasure centers, but there have been some studies in the past in cases of epilepsy and Parkinsonism where people would not respond to any drug therapy and so they decided to have surgery. The doctors would go in and they would be awake, locally anesthetized in their scalp, holes drilled through their skull, and then they would drop electrodes down and start to stimulate until a person's tremors went away. And they could plot out the pathways involved in Parkinsonism and in some cases with epilepsy. That's not the important part of that story. The important part is, as they were probing around in the brain, every once in a while the patient would go, Woo, that feels good. And they'll say, what is it you're feeling? I don't know, try it again. Woo, that feels good. They keep stimulating this pathway, and what they were finding is that they were stimulating pathways that actually went to the pleasure center or came from the pleasure center. So that we now know that the pleasure center is not a center at all. It's actually a pathway that goes through the hypothalamus. And that pathway is known as the medial forebrain bundle, and it's commonly known as the pleasure pathway. Actually, there are two pleasure pathways, one on each side of the brain, and electrical or chemical stimulation of either one of those pathways will allow us to experience pleasure. Now, we can get that pleasure either from drugs or from outside sensations, such as going to a birthday party, being involved in a holiday, winning the state lottery, whatever, will stimulate those pleasure pathways. So it's both conscious and subconscious, chemical and non-chemical. This pleasure pathway is a really important pathway to understand how drugs of addiction are acting. Now, in the human brain, the pleasure pathway runs from the center of the brain through the hypothalamus and up to the front of the brain. And if you can't see it very well, it's because nobody's seen this picture in a real human brain. This is just a, uh, a diagram of where they think it is in a human brain. And that's a lousy picture, I know, because it just gives a real small red line showing that it moves from the front, that goes from the middle of the brain to the front of the brain. You can see it a lot better in, in animal brains where it's really been plotted out, and it goes from the VTA through the LH up to the NACC up to the FC. And that's because I'm an ROTC and an AARP, and I like to use a, a lot of abbreviations. Actually, those do mean something, and here are the words that go with those abbreviations. The lateral hypothalamus is LH. Now, in your handout, you don't have the abbreviations. You might want to put those in there because we're going to be seeing these in some slides to come up. The lateral hypothalamus is LH. The ventral tegmental area is the VTA. The nucleus accumbens is ACC, and the frontal cortex is FC. And scientists like to use abbreviations because it allows them to talk faster instead of saying those, those uh, large neuroanatomical names every time. The two most important parts of the medial forebrain bundle are the VTA and the ACC. This is where most of the drugs of addiction seem to act, in the VTA and the ACC. If you have trouble remembering those, you see the ventral tegmental area and the first three letters of the nucleus accumbens. <clears throat> in 1989, the first inklings of our understanding of where addicting drugs appeared in a review that came out of the University of Montreal. And at that time in 1989, the first, the first vestiges of our understanding stated that they now knew where drugs like opiates caused the high and stimulants like cocaine caused the high in the brain. So they said that opiates such as heroin produced their first effect, their primary effect on the ventral tegmental area to give us the high that people experience when they use that drug. Whereas stimulants such as cocaine and amphetamines act primarily at the nucleus accumbens, which is where 
they produced the high. Now, this was a major breakthrough at the time because people would often have problems understanding how drugs of opposite pharmacological categories could both produce a high. You can understand how a cocaine would produce a high, but sometimes people had trouble understanding how heroin could produce a high. And the very simple answer is that they both affect the medial forebrain bundle. This gets at the heart of the question that a lot of people used to ask me, and they'll say, Carl, is one drug addiction like another drug ad addiction? And so I can have it both ways. I can say, yeah, they're very much alike because they both act on the same pathway. Cocaine and heroin, they both act on the same pathway. But I can have it the other way, too, and I'll say, well, they're not really the same because they act on different parts of the medial forebrain bundle. And we know that the high produced by heroin is not the same as the high produced by cocaine, right? And that's probably because they act on different parts of the medial forebrain bundle. So for the first time now, we're starting to understand how the high from drugs comes about is by acting on this pleasure pathway. Now, please let me exp uh, explain something. The high is not euphoria. Euphoria is defined as a sense of well-being. So any drug which makes you feel good produces euphoria. Euphoria is just not the high, not just the high of heroin or cocaine. It is any drug which makes you feel good. Even smoking produces euphoria because it gives you a sense of well-being when you're a uh, smoker. And certainly nicotine doesn't produce the extreme high that cocaine or heroin does. And that's a very important point. Now look at how compli complex it's gotten. In 1992, they've added even more pathways. Now in your handout, this is a cluttered slide with a whole bunch of drug names down here. And what I've done is I've taken the drug names out and put it on the next slide so you can read them. Uh, and because uh, there's no way you can read them in your handout. Now, it doesn't matter whether you understand the detail of this particular slide. It's simply, I will simply throw this up here for you to understand how far they came from 1989 to 1992. In 1994, they've added even more pathways, but they're coming along a little bit more slowly. For those of you who want some detail, let me just explain this slide. Here's the VTA. Here's the ACC, just as you saw it on the previous slide. Now they've added another pathway that comes out of the ACC that runs on ENK, enkephalin, which is a small endorphin molecule. You'll notice that the VTA pathway runs on dopamine, and this is the uh, dopamine pathway that I showed you earlier is affected by cocaine. We've now added another pathway from the brain area, the, the base of the brain. This is an area called the locus ceruleus. This is one of two parts of the brain that's involved in sleep and wakefulness. When the locus ceruleus kicks out a chemical called norepinephrine, it throws us into what's called um, REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. It's one of two states of sleep that we go through in the evening. Then we have some other regulatory pathways here that run on GABA, the inhibitory neurotransmitter, gamma amidobutyric acid. You see a minus sign indicating that that tends to put negative pressure on the firing of those nerve cells. Then what looks like a pearl necklace here is actually a pathway that goes back the other way compared to the impulses in this other path. This is a descending pathway that's part of the medial forebrain bundle. The circles are actually not there in the brain. These are simply sites of intracranial self-stimulation that have helped them to plot the existence of that pathway. So you'll notice then that there are a large number of different chemicals involved in our, under, our feeling of pleasure, our feeling of euphoria, when the drugs are acting there. Now, the big question is, what drugs act at those sites? And this is, again, how far the pharmacologists have come. The ventral tegmental area is the primary site of action of opiates, such as heroin. It might be the primary site of action of alcohol, barbiturates, benzodiazepines, and nicotine. But you see there's still question marks there because the research has not been completed. Also, there are some controversial papers that suggest that the barbiturates and benzodiazepines may not act on this site at all. And so they've said that maybe these drugs act on the locus ceruleus, which is involved with sleep. And you'll know that barbiturates and benzodiazepines do produce sedation and sleep. Over here in the ACC, these are primary, this is the primary site of action of cocaine, amphetamines. There's a secondary site of action of opiates over here. Ketamine, which is an abused general anesthetic, often abused by anesthesiologists. Nicotine. Tetrahydrocannabinol, or THC, the active ingredient in marijuana, acts at the ACC. And phencyclidine, or PCP, which is angel dust, the street 
drug acts at the ACC. So you see, piece by piece, they're starting to find where these addicting drugs act in the medial forebrain bundle. Five years ago, we didn't know any of this at all. Now, why is it so important to understand where drugs act and how they act in the brain? Well, once you know where they act and how they act, you can come up with strategies to overcome their action. That's the reason that scientists are looking at this so fervently. Now, some people are anal retentive about this medial forebrain bundle. They really get disturbed. They say, Carl, you haven't shown me a good diagram of the medial forebrain bundle yet. I couldn't explain it to my mother if, I, if my mother asked me where it was in the brain. And I'll usually say something, well, someday I'll have a hologram up here that I can bring with me, and it'll be floating in space. It'll be a transparent brain with two red lines going up the middle of it because that's the only way you can get a real good grasp as to the three-dimensional structure of these, of these uh, brain areas. And as it's rotating in space, then you'll be able to see the three-dimensional structure. But I just can't show you that on, on a two-dimensional screen. So you'll have to put up with these white on blue slides for a little while. And what I, what I want to do here with the next two slides is to give you a little bit different idea as to where this medial forebrain bundle is for those of you who really want to know where it is. And here's another one that's not near as colorful as the previous rat brain slide was about five slides ago. Here we have the medial forebrain bundle going from the ventral tegmental area to the nucleus accumbens up to the frontal cortex, just like it showed before, right? No problem. Well, it is a problem. If you look at it from the top down, then you get a different perspective. Now you see not one, but two pathways, one of which goes from the ventral tegmental area up to the nucleus accumbens with a little side trip over here to the amygdala, which is where the emotional component of the pleasure is added. And then you see another pathway that goes from the VTA up to the frontal cortex without stopping in the nucleus accumbens. Well, what's the point? The point is that the bundle is not one pathway, it's more than one pathway. That's why it's called a bundle. It's like a telephone cable. If you slice it, you see a whole bunch of wires inside you were to slice the bundle, you see a whole bunch of nerve pathways inside. The second point is that each one of those pathways could carry a certain aspect of a drug's action. And that would tend to explain why there are so many different actions of a drug, is that each action is carried on a different pathway. Now, I'm simplifying this to make a point. And the point is that there are some characteristics of a, dru some characteristics of a drug's action which are involved in addiction and other characteristics which are not involved in addiction. This is what scientists know for sure right now. Now, in order to complete this story, I'm going to have to speculate a little bit. You notice I haven't said anything about the mechanisms of impaired control over use of the drug. I haven't said a thing about that. So I'm going to have to speculate about that because the research has not been done. And speculation is the way that scientists come up with hypotheses to test in the laboratory. And as I tell my graduate students back at the university, speculation is okay as long as it satisfies three criteria. Number one, it has to be reasonable. Number two, it must be based upon existing knowledge. And most importantly, number three, it has to be testable. If I were to speculate, tell you something that I thought was going on and it was not testable, then that would not be valid speculation because nobody could prove me wrong. So in order to explain this loss of control that really characterizes the disease of addiction, I have to speculate. Now, the speculation begins with a hypothesis about loss of control that was originally published by Robinson and Barrage at the University of Michigan in 1993, and that article is in your list of references. If you care to get the copy of that article and you want to read it, if you're a psychology buff, plan to spend a whole weekend and plan to spend a little bit of time snoozing while you're reading it because it's a very, very complex 25-page review article that's just filled with psychological jargon. But I didn't have to do that because Dr. Robinson came to the University of Texas and gave a seminar, and so I can just tell you what the bottom line of his article was. Dr. Robinson has proposed that one of those pathways I showed you two slides ago could carry the euphoric effect of the drug. He calls that the like pathway. He says that the other pathway that I showed you two slides ago could be called the want pathway, and that's the part of the pathway that carries the craving for the drug. He's also noticed, based upon work in his laboratory and the laboratories of others, that the euphoria is the part that tolerates out when you continue to use a drug over a long period of time. So you've heard of this term tolerance, I'm sure, which means you have to take more and more of the drug to get the same effect you did the first time. 
That's because the euphoria tends to go away as you use the drug if you don't increase the dose. So he said, see, tolerance with chronic use. On the other hand, the craving, as you continue to use the, do the drug, the craving gets worse and worse and worse. It becomes sensitized. And there is good experimental evidence now, primarily coming out of animal studies, to indicate that certain pathways are sensitized by the presence of drugs of addiction, such as cocaine, amphetamine, and other drugs of abuse. This craving sensitizes, so you have an interesting situation that the euphoria is going down with chronic drug use and the craving is going up with chronic drug use. So the addict finds himself in a strange situation. They got to take more and more of the drug to get the euphoria, but the more of the drug they take, the more sensitive they get to the craving, the more they crave it. Now there's some of my colleagues and some people who don't know too much about addictions that say, well, euphoria is addiction. As long as a person likes a drug, they're addicted to it. I had the pleasure of speaking to 600 nurses about three months ago. And I, I played a little game with them and I said, let's see if we understand what addiction is. How many of you think that cocaine is addicting? And they all raised their hand. How many of you think that alcohol is addicting? They all raised their hand. I said, how many of you think that nicotine is addicting? And they all raised their hand. So far, so good. Then I said, how many of you think that caffeine is addicting? And they all raised their hand. And I said, uh-oh, scientists don't think that caffeine is addicting. But I didn't tell them that at that time. I just was thinking that. Then I said, this is very interesting. How many of you think that food is addicting? And they all raised their hand. How many of you think that you can become addicted to another person? And they all raised their hand. How many of you think that sex is addicting? And they all raised their hand a lot. And I said, how many of you think that television is addicting? And they all raised their hand. I said, now you see we're getting into a real problem here. What you're telling me is that anything that makes you feel better is addicting. And that's not right. That's not the scientific definition of addiction. So what I tried to do with them is to narrow the scientific definition, just as I've already done with you. The scientific definition of addiction involves loss of control, inability to stop doing that activity or taking that drug. So is gambling addicting? Yeah, because people lose their control uh, over gambling. They just can't stop. Is eating addicting? And in some people it really is. They can't stop eating. Carbohydrate addicts just... They wake up with donuts uh, visualized around their head. You know, there's a circle of donuts around their head. They, always, they have to continue to eat the carbohydrates. So technically, those are addicting. Sex is addicting in some people. When they lose control, they just can't stop. <clears throat> That's not euphoria. Euphoria is just a sense of well-being. So euphoria is not addicting. It's not loss of control. Some of my colleagues say, well, craving is addicting. I don't think the craving is addicting. I crave a lot of things. I crave chocolate chip cookie dough ice cream. And I'll have a big bowl of chocolate chip cookie dough ice cream, and then I'll stop because I know my triglycerides are going to go out the top, and I say, okay, no more for me. But I sure cra craved it before I had it. Now, you could say, okay, craving times 10 might be addiction. You'd lose control. No, that's not it. That's not what the victims are telling us. See, if you talk to the victims who have this disease, they say something like, I can't stop because I need it. So I said to Dr. Robinson, I said, could we replace this word want with the word need? And he says, no. He says, I'm a psychologist, and that would destroy my psychological construct. I can't do that. And I said, well, would there, could there be another pathway in the medial forebrain bundle that is involved with the need for something? And he said, sure, but why? And I, said, and I explained it to him like this. I said, when I, I said, I'm not a recovering person. I'm not addicted to alcohol or anything that I know of, but this is what I hear when I talk to the people who are addicted. They'll say something like, I need the drug. And I'll say, well, let's just take a, a late stage chronic alcoholic and, and examine their life. They've lost their job. The alcohol has caused them to lose their job, lose their families, and they just come out of a doctor's office that said, unless you stop drinking, you're going to kill yourself. And a person's response will be, where's the vodka? See, that's not rational. And, and before I knew much about this, I would continue to quiz the alcoholic, and I'd say, well, I know why you're drinking is because you get a real great high from drinking, right? And they say, no, I've lost that a long time ago. I can't drink enough to get high. I can't drink enough to feel euphoric anymore. And I say, well, that's even more reason to stop drinking. Why don't you just stop? And they'll say, because I can't. And I'll say, sure you can. I drank in college. I stopped when I saw my grades going down. I stopped, and my grades started to go back up again, and I didn't drink anymore. Why don't you just stop? And they say, I can't. I say, come on, you just have poor willpower. They say, no, it's become such a part of me right now that it's an instinctual drive, almost like food, 
water, and sex. It's become an instinctual drive where I have to have it to exist. Now that's need. You see, that's not want, that's not like, that's need. And that is the disease of addiction that most people just don't understand. When a person says, oh, all they have to do is stop, increase their willpower, they can't. No matter what they do, they're about ready to die, they know the drug has taken over their life, caused them to lose their job and their family, and even that is not a stimulus to stop drinking. And that's the misconception that we have in this field that, oh, it's just a personality defect. That's a misconception because we now know that that need is based upon a neurochemical drive, just like a chemical stimulation of the feeding center, the water drinking control center, or the sex center that makes it impossible for the person with this disease to stop. And that's what the general public doesn't understand, and that's what Congress doesn't understand, and that's why we don't get enough money for our diseases for the treatment, prevention, education, and research of these diseases because nobody understands it, what this disease is all about. Is there anyone who would like to take issue with what I just said or discuss it? Because that's a very important point. I'd like to ask you one thing. What's the reward for meeting the need that's not hurting if it's not for you? The reward for meeting the need is unknown in the individual. Uh, if, if you ask a person why they need food, they'll say, well, I'm hungry. And you'll say, well, okay, once you get filled up, why do you need it the next time? And they'll say, well, because I'm going to get hungry again. And, they'll, and you say, well, if someone were to tell you you can't have food anymore, what would you feel? And you'd say, God, I panic. I, I'm going to die. That's the same way that the alcoholic or the drug addict feels is they have some instinctual drive that says they've got to have the drug to exist. Not necessarily that they're going to die, but they just have to have it. There's a, it's something that they can't explain. And, and if, if you say define need, they can't define their need. They just say, well, I've got to have it. That's all they can tell you. And they don't even feel, they don't hear those words. They just get that feeling that comes from the hypothalamus up to the, the conscious part of the brain, the cortex, that it's a, it's a drive that says they've got to have it. And it's, it's, it's almost impossible to put into words because it's a feeling. Other comments, questions? You see how, how difficult that is to explain? I mean, you can't go in front of car Congress and explain what I just told you in a five-minute testimony. That's impossible because you've got to build up the neurochemical foundation of knowledge and things like that. That's why we're having such a big problem in this field is because you can't get a congressman to sit still long enough to listen to what I just told you over the last hour and a half. So somewhere along the line, there's going to have to be some faith and there's going to have to be enough clamor in people who believe this to say, yes, this is a disease. It's no longer a psychological problem or a sociological problem. It's a disease. Now, again, if there's some of you who don't agree with me, that's okay. I'll be willing to discuss it with you or at least think about it because it's much easier to get money for a, a medical disease than it is for a psychosocial disease. And that's, that's not why we're doing this because we think the, tr the actual truth is that this is a brain chemistry disease and brain chemistry can be understood. We can understand how the brain operates to cause this disease. Ten years from now, 20 years from now, they'll look back and they'll say, how primitive you were in the 1980s and early 1990s thinking that this was a sociological disease. How primitive you were. We now have the brain neurotechnology to be able to see the neurochemical problems in the brains of alcoholics. Just kind of have to put yourself in the future and say, we're really very basic right now. We're just starting to understand this. Yes? In your discussion about what is and what is not um, addictive as a drug, you can say that alcohol is, but caffeine, for instance, is not. How do you factor in the presence of physiological symptoms when you stop using that drug as a determinant of whether or not it's Okay, the question is, how do we factor in the physiological changes when a person stops using the drug? Those are just side effects of addiction. They're not part of addiction. They're not the causes of addiction. Some people like to say physical dependence or withdrawal is the reason that the person needs the drug. It's not because a lot of people who abuse the drug often have withdrawal symptoms. People who abuse drugs often show tolerance. But those are no longer felt to be causes of addiction. They are simply side effects of addiction and abuse. But are they a defining quality of an addictive drug? I guess 
Okay, the question is, are they a defining quality of an addictive drug? No. Nicotine, I mean, uh, caffeine is not addicting because it doesn't produce loss of control in people. I don't know very many people who drink 50 cups of coffee a day. <laughs> 50? Uh, but there is physical withdrawal with caffeine, and that's what, in fact, it's, it's so discouraging because USA Today, four weeks ago, carried a little article that says, studies show that caffeine is addicting. And it's a new study that came out of Johns Hopkins indicating that caffeine produces withdrawal. You see, even the newspapers still don't understand this. When they see withdrawal, the headline comes out, addicting. Well, if you look in the original paper, they never once said the word addicting. They simply said caffeine produces physical dependence. And physical dependence is not the dependence that we're talking about here, and we're going to talk about that in more detail when we get into some controversial issues later. Yes? Is that kind of dependence... Addicting drugs, did they literally change your neurochemistry? But, like, caffeine does not necessarily change the neurochemistry, but it adds something else that that causes the body to do something else. Is that right? Well, kind of. The, the, the question is, do, do addicting drugs change the brain chemistry? Yes. But what is the reason they cause brain chemistry, and, and what is, is there a cause and effect? I think that's what you're asking. The difference with caffeine not being addicting is that there is no pre-existing pathology that causes a person to use caffeine to feel better. Whereas with all these other drugs, in the addict, they have a neurochemical problem that causes the person to use that drug to feel better. And we'll get into that in just a moment. If, if There is no caffeine neurochemistry that's abnormal. There is no abnormality in the brain that causes people to use caffeine to feel better and lose control over the use of that. Whereas with all these other addicting drugs, there is a neurochemical problem that causes the person to use that drug so that they lose control. Yes? That's what I'm my question. Does the disease cause you to initially drink, or does it affect the frequency, the, the, uh, the amount, the quantities that you consume when you do your... Okay, does the neurochemistry cause you to begin drinking, or does it affect the quantities that you drink after, once you start? Once you start. Or, or when the alcoholic chose alcohol over cocaine, or, or you born with this <coughs> desire to satisfy, and you just choose alcohol over some other chemical. Okay. Uh, the question is, are you born with this, or you do, do you choose to drink alcohol over use of some other chemical? It goes back to this medial forebrain bundle. You'll notice that when we had lists of drugs in the nucleus accumbens and the ventral tegmental area, if someone has as their drug of choice cocaine, we would assume that something is wrong with their nucleus accumbens that causes them to want to use cocaine to overcome that dysfunction of the nucleus accumbens. If alcohol is eventually found to work primarily in the ventral tegmental area, then the alcoholic is the one who has an abnormality of the ventral tegmental area and uses the drug to overcome that perceived abnormality. Now, are we born with this? When we talk about the genetics, uh, I'll fill you in with that. But we believe that most people are born with that neurochemical defect, but it may not show up until later in life, just like the Parkinson patient doesn't exhibit the signs of Parkinsonism until later in life, and that's because the neurochemistry goes down to a certain level that you see the symptoms. And I'm going to explain this in more detail in just a moment. Okay, well, why don't I do that? Because I think the next slides uh, actually get to that. And we've got 40, 40 minutes before we have a break. Are you all sitting, seating all right? Are you comfortable? All right, all right. I, I don't think anyone's fallen asleep yet, so we might be setting a record here. I, this must be the cold room that's keeping you awake. Well, if some scientists come along in the future and say, yeah, Dr. Erickson was right in 1994, we found the need pathway. Well, what's the pathology of the need pathway? Now, this, this is no longer speculation here. This we know. There are four major neurotransmitters that seem to be involved with drug addictions. And they are all felt to be involved in a deficiency state so that we don't have enough dopamine or we don't have enough serotonin or we don't have enough endorphins or we don't have enough GABA. And 
I've taken the liberty of speculating which parts of the medial forebrain bundle these deficiencies may be occurring in, but that's, this stuff is speculation over here. The, the lack of neurotransmitters is not speculation. That's been found very well by what these drugs do to uh, neurotransmitters in animal brains. So we're talking about the pathology being not enough neurotransmitter, one of these neuro neurotransmitters in the brains of the drug addict. Now take it one step further, there could be a different deficiency for each addictive drug. For example, we can speculate pretty strongly that the cocaine addict probably doesn't have enough dopamine in the nucleus accumbens. That's probably the reason why the cocaine addict loses control over cocaine, because they don't have enough dopamine. They don't have enough dopamine, so they use the cocaine to restore the dopamine to feel better. And for heroin, they probably don't have enough of what? I think you can figure that out. Endorphins, right? They probably don't have enough endorphins. And with alcohol, it could be any one of those. In fact, they've gone so far as to say that maybe there's not one alcoholism, there are four, at least, neuro uh, four alcoholisms, four subtypes of alcoholism. Maybe some alcoholics don't have enough dopamine, some alcoholics don't have enough serotonin, some alcoholics don't have enough endorphins, some alcoholics don't have enough GABA. So we could have subtypes of alcoholism, and this wouldn't be the first time that we've subtyped alcoholism. Jelinek did it in the 1930s, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon. Cloninger did it based upon genetics in the 1980s, type 1, type 2, type 3. And maybe the 1990s is going to be the decade of the neurochemists, type Type D, type S, type E, type G, whatever you wanted to call it. Could be neurochemical subtypes. Then we could say maybe there's multiple deficiencies of those neurotransmitters in those poor critters, those poor victims, who have excessively severe forms of addiction. In the more severe forms of alcoholism, we know some people go through 12 different types of treatment during their life and they die drunk because not one of the treatments helps. And maybe those are the poor people who have deficiencies of all four of those neurotransmitters. Very difficult to reverse. Maybe we'd have multiple deficiencies in poly addictions, such as addictions to cocaine and heroin, cocaine and alcohol, heroin and alcohol, pot and nicotine. Maybe there's multiple deficiencies that people are trying to make up with different combinations of drugs. Or maybe they, have, they are addicted to cocaine and also have an eating disorder. Or maybe they're addicted to alcohol and also have a sexual disorder because of multiple deficiencies of those neurotransmitters. And in dual diagnosis, where a person is depressed and alcoholic or schizophrenic and abuse, uh, addicted to cocaine, they would have multiple neurotransmitter deficiencies. Yes? Is it trial and error? Say you're polyaddicted uh, to one or more. Is it sort of like if you hit on something, you may have the deficiency, but you don't realize it? You may be dealing with, or you may be uh, supplanting the deficiency with alcohol, but then just one day somebody offers you a joint, and from then on you're on marijuana. Is it something you know to go after, or is it something that just trial and error may happen? Okay, the question is, do you seek it out because you feel the deficiency, or is it trial and error? It's probably trial and error. Because very often people who are going to become addicted to one drug will often try a lot of they'll try them all and they'll settle on one that they really like and that's probably the one that's best best satisfying their neurochemistry but that's driven by that satisfaction it's driven by the, the need for the drug right <clears throat> so these neurotransmitters that are involved in addictions uh, I just want to review this again and this is a, an abstract slide because these colors up here don't mean anything right now. But these are the four major neurotransmitters that are involved. Now, I hope you hear what I'm saying. This is exactly what's happening right now in your brains, is that every part of your brain has cycling neurotransmitters. Now, your brain stem, which is involved with alertness, you'll find as you go through the afternoon, sometimes you get a little sleepy, and other times you're more alert. And that's because your neurotransmitters are cycling in the part of the brain that keeps you alert or that allows you to go to sleep at night. And as long as they cycle within a normal range, everything's okay. Just like your moods will be high during one part of the day and lower at one part of the day because your neurotransmitters are cycling. But it's when you get out of that normal range that you start to see pathology. 
the pathology would be seen in cases of clinical depression or in a severe case, or in an interesting case, like manic depressive psychosis, where the neurotransmitters cycle up out of the normal range and then down below the normal range. And a person literally feels real high, and then they feel real low, and it can cycle fast in some people or it can cycle real slowly in other people. And that's because the neurotransmitters are going outside the normal range. In schizophrenia, we think that the neurotransmitters are cycling down below the normal range, uh, I'm sorry, up above the normal range with too much dopamine in a particular part of the brain. So we can explain almost every mental illness by the cycling of the neurotransmitters. And so people will have periods of normalcy, and then they'll, then they'll have periods of pathology. Is it too much to think that we could have cycling neurotransmitters in the medial forebrain bundle in a particular case of a drug addiction so that when it gets too low, the person needs the drug? So they'll seek out the drug and use it and use it and use it, and they'll lose control to get their neurotransmitters back up into the normal range because the, the tendency of an organism is to try to normalize itself. So if it doesn't have enough neurotransmitter, it seeks something outside that will satisfy that. And in the case of an addiction, it's the drug which normalizes it. You follow that? Now, if a person points their finger at a drug addict and says, you've got to get treatment, you've got to get off your drug, they take the drug away, they throw them into treatment, they do something called detox, and they may go through withdrawal or they may be very uncomfortable for a while, but then they've got to learn to live without the drug. How do they do that? They go through treatment. They will go through 28-day inpatient treatment in which you throw the book at them, group therapy, 12-step therapy, education, ropes courses, whatever you can throw at them, relaxation, meditation, and hope that something sticks. And at the end of 28 days, if they come out and they feel pretty good, or at the end of the 12-step recovery process they feel good, what they've done is to learn how to normalize their own brain chemistry. And we're going to talk about that later when we talk about how the 12 steps uh, are actually answered by science. So treatments then take the place of the drug by teaching the person or training the person how to access their own brain chemistry and bring it back up into normal. Now you would expect that a lot of people couldn't do that, and those are probably the people who never get treated successfully. They don't learn how to do, they don't learn how to change their brain chemistry. What's the evidence for what I just said? Well, there's a lot of evidence in, in animal experiments. We know that if you train an animal to press a lever for food or to learn a new task and you have a probe in their brain and you're measuring neurotransmitters, you can see that chemistry changes as the animal learns a new task. We also know that the brain chemistry in an animal is a lot different if they've been brought up in isolation compared to animals that are brought up in groups their brain chemistries are a lot different. So environment, learning, psychology can all change brain chemistry. Now that's an outrageous statement for someone to say with no backing. But it's, uh, being a neurochemist, I can just see, I can see the well, overwhelming amount of literature that points in that direction, but nobody has ever proven what I just said. That's speculation. But that's a promise for the future, and I think it's very exciting. Someday we'll be able to measure neurotransmitters in human brains and be able to see those changes during treatment and see if Carl Erickson is correct in 1994. <clears throat> okay, this is the first of our controversial issues. So we'll take a couple of these and then we'll have, we'll have a break. Addictions are diseases. Are diseases? No, there are actually several diseases. Well, I've been speaking like that all day, but, and so why do I have to go over it again? The reason I have to go over it again is because it's such an emotional subject for some people. There are people out there that are writing best-selling books saying that alcoholism is not a disease, and those types of books, written by non-respected, non uh, not knowledgeable people outside the field. They're usually philosophers or sociologists who don't, have never really been involved with alcoholism are intellectually talking about the fact that these are not diseases. That's what their fact is, but the fact just does not follow the uh, research literature. They attack the genetics studies. They attack the neurochemical studies. And what they're really doing is showing their ignorance because what they're talking about is abusers. That's why it's so important to differentiate between somebody who abuses a drug, who has control, and people who don't have control. And those people who are writing best-selling books saying alcoholism is not a disease are only looking at those people who drink a lot and drink 
over a long period of time, which is not the definition of alcoholism. So let's just go through this step by step, because the, whenever you see a book that says um, controlled drinking is possible or alcoholism is not a disease, what happens is that that slows down the progress of our being able to conquer this disease and thousands of people die as long as we continue to argue that point. Most people believe that alcoholism is a disease. A Gallup poll in 1992 said that 90% of the U.S. population says, oh yeah, alcoholism is a disease. What's the big deal? The big deal is that the people, the uh, general public is confused about what a disease is because 60% of the same respondents in that Gallup poll said that people have control over their drinking. It's a personality defect. You can't have it both ways. But yet the Gallup poll indicates that there's a lot of confusion in people's minds. Anyone who's ever had the disease or worked with the victims of the disease realizes that this is a disease. Yeah. The confusion is the disease, in some people's mind, causes what they perceive are personality defects. Mm -hmm. The way you behave, the way you act, they, they get confused. And that's right. That's a, that's a really good point because some people believe that the disease causes what we see as symptoms that look like the disease. All the, the behaviors, the emotions, the denial, the defenses, uh, the delusions associated with drug use are now seen to be the disease. And that's not the disease. The disease is up here. So the, uh, the people who have recovered in AA call this the wreckage of the past. And that's why they have to go to AA 12 steps is to clear away the wreckage of the past. But AA does not cure the disease because that's, it doesn't do anything to up here except to normalize the brain chemistry temporarily. That's how they're able to remain abstinent for a long period of time. Some people still get confused about this. They say, well, if you go through 12 steps and you stop drinking, then you're not an alcoholic, right? Because you're able to stop. Now, if you're able to stop on your own without, without comprehensive multidimensional therapy, then you're an abuser. But if it takes comprehensive multidimensional therapy to get you better, then you're an addict. Well, how do you find multidimensional therapy? 28-day inpatient, 30-day inpatient, the high-cost uh, inpatient therapy or wherever it, uh, you know, insurance covers it or wherever it's in a VA system or something like that, when they have the funds, uh, that would be comprehensive, multidimensional. It's also called shotgun therapy by some people because they throw everything they can at people. Yes, sir? Misuse or abuse is psychologically based. And see, that's where we get the confusion is... People, you can't, you can't tell when a person is drinking whether they are doing it on purpose or whether they're patholo pathologically drinking. You can't tell by looking at them. But everybody assumes that that is addiction because they're drinking lots. Remember I said earlier, this is not a too much, too often disease. It's an I can't stop disease. I mean, all of us in this room probably know people who drink like fish. And you say, well, they're alcoholic because they drink so much. Not so. You have to take a look at them over a long period of time. Usually I give examples like this earlier and I forgot, so your question prompts me to give examples that would tend to clarify this, I hope. How about, how about the soldiers in Vietnam when they used drugs heavily? They drank, they used cocaine, pot, heroin, they used everything over there. I think I would have used drugs if I was fighting in Vietnam. You know, all the misery going on and having to be shot at and things like this. But then when they came back, most of them went back to no drug use at all or just social use of drugs. So could we say that they were addicted in Vietnam and when they came back they weren't? No, I don't think so. And another example is that, God forbid, what if your spouse gets killed in an accident and, and you have tremendous grief and the only way that you know how to take care of that is by drinking. You anesthetize yourself by drinking. And you wake up every morning with an empty vodka bottle next to your bed the typical, prototypical picture of an alcoholic with an empty vodka bottle next to the bed. And you do that day after day after day because you've built up the tolerance. And then you work, learn how to work through the grief. And after a while, you can deal with the grief and your drinking goes down. See, if somebody had taken a snapshot of your drinking during that grief process, they would have said, oh, you're an alcoholic. But the fact is that once they work through the grief process, the drinking goes down. And they were simply using the drug to anesthetize their grief for a short period of time. So you can't tell whether the person is alcoholic just by looking at them over a short period of time. Another example, which is anecdotal, but I've heard it repeated by so many people, is in my life, I had a friend who used to come over every Saturday and help me build a deck behind my, death, behind my house. 
And we would order two cases of Budweiser every Saturday for four of us. And Jim would drink one case himself. And as long as he showed up at 9 o'clock in the morning, he said, put a Budweiser in my hand and give me a hammer and nails and a saw and I'm ready to go. And just as long as you kept him filled up with beer, he would just be working out there and he'd have a great time. And after about 4.30, we'd have to cut him off because the deck started to tilt where he was working on it. But he would do that routinely. And one day he started throwing up blood. So he went to the doctor and the doctor said, how much beer do you drink, Jim? And unlike most people, Jim was truthful. He didn't say just two beers. He said, well, I have a couple of six packs a day. And the doctor said, you're going to kill yourself if you don't stop drinking. So Jim went back and he said, I didn't know that. And he started drinking Kool-Aid. He just stopped beer just like that with no problems. He started drinking Kool-Aid. His wife said he had to have something in his hand. So she kept filling it up with Kool-Aid and he would drink the Kool-Aid just like he used to drink the beer. So he was an alcoholic. We used to talk about him as if he was an alcoholic. But he was an alcoholic because he just stopped just like that with no therapy whatsoever. Now, we, we thought that Jim was an alcoholic just because of the quantity that he consumed, a whole case a day. But you see, that's how you get this misinformation as to what's really going on. He was just an alcohol abuser, and he abused it so much he started throwing up blood. And once he knew that his life was more important than the alcohol, he just stopped drinking the alcohol. But an alcoholic couldn't have done that. An alcoholic would have said, okay, doc, thanks. I think maybe if I drink beer, it'll stop the bleeding because it'll anesthetize the esophagus. You know, that's the rationale that an al alcoholic would go through. Do you, does that clarify your question at all? Yeah, okay. The other problem is the definition of a disease. I, I dare say that if I asked you to take out a pencil and paper and write a definition of the disease, you'd have a hard time. I tried to do that one time. I don't know how to define a disease. You go to the American Heritage Dictionary, and it says something like, a pathological disorder, uh, which is manifested as symptoms and signs that the doctor can recognize. You know, it's, it's really not very helpful. The definition uh, that I've come up with, I think, is on, a, on the next slide. It's a pathological state which the individual never intends to acquire. You see, a person doesn't wake up in the morning saying, I think I'll get diabetes today, or I think I'll get cancer today, or I think I'll have a heart attack today. I, I'm a little bored. I think I'll have a heart attack today. Or, I think I'll become an alcoholic today. You see, they're all the same. Nobody intends to get the disease. And, and I'll go into that in just a moment. Diseases are not self-induced. Example, diabetes, polio, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, AIDS, and alcoholism all fall into the same category. They're not self-induced. You may say, well, the alcoholic drinks himself into the, the disease. There are a lot of alcoholics who don't drink themselves into a disease. There are 12-year-old fully diagnosed alcoholics who don't drink themselves into the disease. They're almost like an instant alcoholic. You pour alcohol on them and they become alcoholic. They don't spend years drinking and eventually drink themselves into the disease. There are also people out there who can go for days, weeks, months, and even years without drinking, but once they start to drink, they go off on a three-day binge. They lose control. They don't drink themselves into the disease. They just lose control. They can't handle it. They have no trouble stopping. They just can't. They have no trouble starting. They just can't stop. Certain of those diseases are preventable, right? But does that mean that the condition exists for the disease to exist, but we can prevent its onset? I'm mm -hmm. thinking diabetes. You know, I'm watching that because it's in my family. Right. But <clears throat> by diet and other things, I can prevent that. AIDS is preventable. Um, alcoholism, if you don't drink. Okay. Uh, they are somewhat preventable. You, you cannot prevent the onset of diabetes totally. You may delay it, but you cannot prevent it if you're going to get it. You cannot prevent AIDS if you have a blood transfusion with HIV positive, right, H HIV negative. Uh, you, will not, you will not prevent it because now there are other types of AIDS that you can prevent because of behavioral patterns, but in every case, you can't prevent it. So you see there's an aspect of Slowing, on, slowing down the onset in many cases. Heart disease, we can slow down the onset through diet, sure. But eventually, if you're going to get it, you're going to get it. All right. <clears throat> the incidence of a disease remains stable unless a valid prevention measure or cure is found. As long as I've been in this field for about 25 years, the incidence of alcoholism in the United States population has always been 5 to 6%. Even during prohibition, 
even during times when we raise the drinking age, even during times when we increase beverage excise taxes, no matter what you do, the incidence of the disease will remain, remain stable. When Gorbachev, uh, I think it was Gorbachev, uh, invoked prohibition in the uh, Soviet Union, he, he shut down all the manufacture of, of alcohol in the Soviet Union. Guess what happened? The emergency rooms filled up with alcoholics who had been drinking paint thinner and other solvents because they had to have something. They, could, they needed it. And when they couldn't find the alcohol, they drank something else. That's an indication that the disease is always there regardless of what you do. Again, if you restrict access, the alcoholics will always find something to drink. If you restrict access to cocaine, the cocaine addicts will always find cocaine, even if they have to go to Mexico, Peru, any place, or they make it in their kitchen, whatever. They will find a way to get it. Many addicted individuals do not progress from use, uh, misuse and addiction. Now, this, this is a uh, diagram that was published in 1990 in a book called Broadening the Base of Treatment for Alcohol Problems. A blue ribbon panel set up by the National Academy of Sciences uh, a subunit called the Institute of Medicine. They put together a blue ribbon panel to look at what we knew at that, that time about how effective is treatment of alcoholism. The bottom line of the book, published in 1990, was that we need more research on treatment outcome. They didn't come to a conclusion. They simply looked at all the research that had been done. But in the very first chapter, they, they showed this terminological map which plotted alcohol consumption versus alcohol problems in the U.S. population. So over here where you have none, this is roughly a third of the U.S. population doesn't drink at all. And then you have other people who drink and they get into problem drinking, alcoholism, abuse, dependence, alcohol-related disabilities, all these terms that people tend to get confused about. And you'll notice that they overlap and there are question marks and things like this. The two things that you can be sure of here is that dependence is the same as alcoholism at the far right side of the scale, alcohol consumption versus alcohol problems and abuse is separate from dependence, so everybody agrees with that. Even the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual 4 that just came out separates dependence and abuse. So that no longer is really a, a question. But what this does is it suggests that you start out here with no alcohol consumption, and the more alcohol consumption you have, the more problems you have until you become alcoholic. So it suggests that everybody starts out on a level playing field, and then you drink and then you abuse, and then you walk through a magic looking glass, and all of a sudden you're alcoholic. But just like I said earlier, there are 12-year-old alcoholics that don't do this. There are some people who never have used cocaine. They use cocaine on Thursday, and on Sunday they go have to go into treatment because they've lost control. You see, they don't use cocaine, and they don't abuse themselves into the disease. So most of these addictions, many of them do, but most of... Most of them don't progress from use to misuse to dependence. You don't drink yourself into the disease. You don't use the drug and become dependent simply because you've been using it. The cause of the addiction is something else other than use of the drug. Have you heard in the past that, oh, we know the cause of al alcoholism, it's alcohol. Have you heard people say that? It's not alcohol. Alcohol is only the, the component which causes us to see the disease. Yes? Well, Verify that. Just ask any alcoholic, uh, were, were they ever a social drinker? And they'll tell you the first time, and every time they drank, they got drunk. They got out of control. They never progressed to the point of being out of control. They started out. That's right, exactly right. For those of you who, don't, who haven't talked to alcoholics and don't know what he just said, uh, very, it's almost diagnos diagnostic. If you ask an alcoholic if they remember their first drink, they'll almost always say yes because their first drink caused them to react in such a way that they knew they were reacting differently than the people around them. Some alcoholics say, I never felt normal. I felt like I was born on another planet until I had my first drink. And then with my first drink, everything just fell into place. Clink, 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 and I felt normal. I felt like I fit in with everybody else. Some alcoholics report that. Other alcoholics report, well, if alcohol had affected the person on a bar stool next to me the same way it affected me, they would have been alcoholic too because it gave them a cocaine-like high, an exaggerated euphoria that most people don't get that type of euphoria when they drink alcohol. They get just a little high. Now, I, I drink bourbon and ginger ale before dinner. I just get a little high with that. Eight ounces in a glass and I'm fine. No. <laughs> so, uh, but, but the alcoholic gets an exaggerated response in some cases, not all cases, and that's probably the subtype of alcoholic that... Uh, 
has a massive release of endorphins when they drink. You're not saying that, uh, an alcohol, that a person who starts drinking and drinks over a period of years gradually gets worse and worse and worse, and they can't they finally end up alcoholic like that? Are you saying that that's, uh, that that's not the way it happens? There are a lot of people who drink socially and then abuse or drink a lot, and then they eventually show the signs of addiction later on, right? There are a lot of people. Yeah, there are a lot of people who do that. But what I'm saying is that some people, if you go out on the street and you say, what's an alcoholic like? They say, well, they're the ones who started drinking, they drank more, and they eventually became alcoholic. Uh, see, there's a misconception out there that all alcoholics do that. What I'm saying is that all alcoholics don't do that. Many of them do. Either way, right. Uh, now, now, that's an unanswered question scientifically is what about people who drink themselves into the disease? Is it possible for people to drink themselves into the disease? I think it is. But scientifically, I have a hard time explaining it. Because you see, what would have to happen if that occurred is that the person would drink alcohol and alcohol and alcohol till it impacted the part of the medial forebrain bundle that caused loss of control. And it would have to impact that part specifically. And the problem I have is that alcohol is not a specific acting drug. It acts throughout the whole brain. And it would probably cause destruction of some other brain area before it would affect that medial forebrain bundle where we see the loss of control. So I think cocaine is much more likely to do that. I think that we can abuse ourselves by into cocaine addiction. I think we can do that a lot better because cocaine has a specific receptor site in the medial forebrain bundle where the drug accumulates and could cause toxicity and cause loss of control. Same way with heroin. I think you could abuse yourself into an addiction with heroin a lot easier than you could by drinking alcohol. Okay, now I know this is probably getting on, uh, into a wrong area here, but uh, I have also heard for years that uh, the use of any alcohol destroys or kills brain cells. Is that still uh, valid? Thank you for asking that question. The question is, is it still valid that alcohol destroys or kills brain cells? You have to qualify uh, what you're saying. There is a, mis a bit of misinformation out there that a single drink causes destruction of brain cells. That's not true. We know that social drinking does not cause destruction of brain cells. Any of you who are social drinkers can heave a sigh of relief. Uh, that that m myth, that misinformation came the best I can track it back, from a study in a dog that was done by a scientist in which he gave the dog quantities of alcohol day after day after day over a two-week period, sacrificed the animal, took out the brain, sliced up the brain, and looked at it under a microscope, much as we do in microbiology class. You put a grid down and you can count the number of cells that are dead. And, and he found some cells that were dead after giving that animal alcohol for a two-week period. And he extrapolated it up to the whole brain and said, we got so many thousands of nerve cells killed in that animal's brain, and then he divided by the number of individual alcohol doses he gave over the two-week period. It's not the same situation. We do know that alcohol causes brain cell death in extreme cases of alcohol abuse or alcoholism where a person is constantly bathing their brain in alcohol over a 24-hour period in many cases. And on autopsy, we see black spots in a part of the brain called the hippocampus, which is involved with memory and learning and things like this. And it's probably the reason why in advanced cases of extreme alcohol abuse or alcoholism, we see confusion, disorientation, memory loss. It's because that part of the brain has been destroyed by alcohol. It seems to be very, very sensitive to alcohol. It also correlates with blackouts. Blackouts are not killing of nerve cells. Blackouts mean that you're knocking out the hippocampus, which is involved with memory, because, but you're only knocking it out temporarily. And, and uh, that's not diagnostic of alcoholism. It's just diagnostic of heavy alcohol abuse. So we see blackouts in both alcohol abusers and alcoholics because the hippocampus is very sensitive to the effects of alcohol. It's been well shown in animal studies that the hippocampus is knocked out by, by chronic alcohol exposure. But it's reversible unless you give it for 20 years of a person's life. Then you start to see brain cell death. Okay, you're all with me on this so far? 
So, the disease is technically a state of impaired control over drug-taking behavior. And keep in mind this phrase, abuse is a problem to solve, addiction is a disease to conquer. This is a disease to conquer, whereas abuse is a social problem, a psychological problem, and we can't get the two confused. Glantix. Now, this is a transition slide. Two people who, while making out, open their eyes at the same time to see if the other is looking. <laughs> This gets back to what we talked about before. Tolerance and physical dependence are not hallmark signs of addiction. Now, some treatment centers don't like to hear me say this because tolerance and physical dependence are intake criteria for some, for some treatment centers. Say, well, if a person's going to go through withdrawal, that means they're addicted. You see, I think we're, we're caught in a time warp here, and this is where the misconception has come along. There's a World Health Organiz Organization definition that was published in 1950 that many of us are still operating under today. That definition said that for a drug to be addicting, it had to have three characteristics. Psychological dependence, which means roughly the same as habituation or craving. Tolerance, which means you have to take more and more of the drug to get the same effect you did the first time. And physical dependence means that the body adapts to the presence of the drug over a period of time so that the person can only function with the drug in their body. And then when they stop taking the drug, they go through something called withdrawal. <clears throat> Most people forget that that definition was custom-made for heroin, which is a worldwide epidemic in 1950. Heroin is a central nervous system depressant. And the World Health Organization said, well, this must be a good definition because alcohol has all three of those characteristics and barbiturates have all three of those characteristics. And it wasn't long after that that you started to see theories in pharmacological textbooks that were popping up to explain the withdrawal that we see with physical dependence, which was the hyperactivity the withdrawal hyperactivity that was manifested as shakes and delirium tremens and seizures, things like that. But the problem with this definition was the big lie. The big lie was that cocaine was not addicting because it didn't produce physical dependence. In fact, today, we know that the withdrawal from cocaine is 95% psychological and emotional and only 5% physical. You can't see that 5% withdrawal very well. So they were saying cocaine is not addicting because it doesn't produce physical dependence. See the problem with that? And there were pharmacologists like me in the 1960s getting off expert witness stands, putting $100 bills in our back pocket after just testifying that old Charlie over there is not an addict because he only uses cocaine. And that's a bad situation. So the World Health Organization said, well, we got a problem. And they, in 1964, they said, let's get rid of the word addiction. It has too much... Uh, negative stigma associated with it. It really doesn't mean much anymore. So they said, let's use dependence of the blank type. Let's use that phrase. Dependence of the cocaine type, fill in your favorite drug. Dependence of the heroin type. Dependence of the Kool-Aid type. Whatever you wanted to put in there. People would understand what you mean. But you see, that problem was, that, the, that was a bad situation because people said, which dependency are you talking about? Phys psychological or physical? So they got even more confused. So dependence didn't mean what the World Health Organization wanted it to. And I remember that def definition didn't last very long. So today's definitions, which now I think almost everyone agrees to, is that addiction is a pattern of chronic compulsive drug-taking behavior which is harmful, and dependence is interchangeable with the term addiction. It's a state of drug use in which the primary symptom is impaired control over drug use. You see, compulsive drug-taking behavior is roughly the same as impaired control over drug use. So that's why they tend to use these two terms interchangeably. And if you're going to ask me, which dependence are you talking about? Is it psychological or is it physical? My answer has to be, it's both. Because it's physical since it's neurochemically based, that's physical. And it's psychological because the person feels it as a compulsive impaired control over drug use. That's psychological. So the word dependence these days no longer should be associated with the words psychological or physical. That only confuses people. And it even confuses people when they say, I've heard people use the term physical addiction and psychological addiction. That sends shivers up my back because it doesn't mean anything. If you just keep it very simply in mind that addiction or dependence is impaired control over use of the drug, forget about tolerance, forget about physical dependence. That means that tolerance and physical dependence are no longer hallmark signs of addiction. And what even makes it more 
believable, I think, is that people who abuse drugs often show tolerance and physical dependence. So those are not defining criteria for addiction. It's simply, those are simply criteria for excessive use of the drug. And this is not a too much, too often disease. It's an I can't stop disease. Margraine, the blinding pain from drinking margarita slush too quickly. <laughs> Well, I don't have impaired control. It is possible for me to stop right now for a break. And why don't we come back at, uh, we'll give you an extra five minutes. Let's come back at 3.15 sharp, and I'll start up then. <clears throat> Thanks for coming back on time. Before we get started on another controversial issue, I'd like to kind of pull some things together here. People were asking me questions at the break, and it indicated that I didn't make some things real clear, and it also gives me a chance to answer some of the questions that you had at the beginning so that I we make sure that I can cover it with that before we run out of time. One of the, one of the points that, that I really didn't say too much about is the the difference in treatment between abusers and alcoholics. Now we'll just talk about alcohol here for a moment. We first of all know that in the 12-step recovery process, that is not specific just for alcoholics. Uh, if any of you know the 12-step recovery process or AA, the only requirement for going to AA is that you want to stop drinking, which means you could be either an abuser or an alcoholic. And some people have gone so far as to say that maybe AA works better for abusers than for alcoholics. I don't think that's the case. Also, AA does work. And I think I told you earlier that I think it works because the 12-step process teaches people how to access their own brain chemistry. The pr only problem with AA is twofold. Number one, people who go to AA meetings and don't stay don't give it a chance. They'll come in, they'll, they'll look at an AA meeting and say, this is a bunch of drunks, I don't want to be here. I'm not one of those. Or they may say, well, there's too much smoking going on here and I never like smoking, so I'm not going to go to this AA group. What they fail to do is to try other AA groups. They really have to give it a chance. So they'll take, they'll take one AA group and think that it's representative of all of them. And in actuality, you have to keep traveling around until you find one that's most comfortable for you. But a the second thing is that AA doesn't work for everybody. It only, according to the statistics, it's only available and useful for about 10% of the alcoholics. How do we get that figure? You take that 5 to 6% incidence figure I showed you earlier. That's a federal government figure of the alcoholics in the nation. That's roughly 15 to 18 million people are alcoholic. And if you take the AA census themselves that they took in 1992, a snapshot of attendance at meetings, they extrapolated that to be nationally about 1.2 million people attending AA meetings at any one time. You divide those two figures and that's about 10%. It doesn't mean that AA doesn't work. It works great for those people that follow through, go to 90 meetings in 90 days, decide to work the program and so forth. works fine. So we have to find some other way to help those people who do not respond to AA. Um, I told you that we know how to take care of, of people who are abusers those of you in the criminal justice system probably are wondering how can we sort these people out. Well, sometimes you can't sort them out. The scientists can sort them out very well because they have a large battery of tests available. What they'll do is they'll take a blood sample and they'll look at mean corpuscular volume and an enzyme in the, in the blood that is indicative of liver dysfunction. That's an indicator that the person is drinking a lot. Then they'll do uh, some psychosocial tests like the MMPI and the Addiction Severity Index and sometimes the SASE, the Substance Abuse Subtle Screening Inventory, and that will give them an idea as to whether the person is, is addicted to a substance. Then they'll also look at the drinking history. They'll do a complete physical on them, and they'll talk to members of the family to see if they can get an idea as to whether the person has lost control. And then they'll use dsm 4 criteria, which, as you know, uh, perhaps you know that there are criteria that are set up by the American Psychiatric Association published in a book and if a person has three of seven criteria uh, then they are diagnosed as addicted. So scientists can do this and they have to do it when they do controlled studies. They have to know who's alcoholic and who's not. 
Those of you in this room don't have access to all of those, and a physician doesn't have access to all of those, so your best bet is to use an alcoholism counselor, a substance abuse counselor, who can come pretty close. Now, even if there's a misdiagnosis, it doesn't hurt if you treat an abuser in an alcoholic situation, alcoholic treatment situation, because chances are they're going to get better. But we know that abusers respond to different treatment than alcoholics, and so the very important reason for separating the two, if you possibly can, is to make your treatment much more specific and much less expensive. Abusers respond to education, coercion, uh, jailing one time. That'll usually be enough to stop them from drinking and driving, for example. Um, an example would be an education. Abusers respond to education. You can see that happening in colleges. The heaviest drinking point in a person's life is a freshman in college. That's, they're away from home for the first time. They tend to abuse alcohol. They go to a lot of parties. They go to fraternity and sorority mixers and so forth. And they'll drink a lot. And then the next heaviest year is the sophomore year, and then it tends to fall off. That's because they're self-educating and finding that if they party too much, their grades go down. And they're just abusing. Those kids, those college students who, in light of the fact that their grades are going down and partying too much, continue to drink heavily, they may be alcoholic. And they're a very small percentage. So that's self-education. Coercion. Nagging by a spouse will often reduce drinking. That's abuse. But an alcoholic doesn't respond to those. In fact, they may respond by drinking more in those cases. So when you're treating an abuser in an alcohol treatment situation, it's, it's going to work, but it's just not very, uh, it's, not, it's, pretty, it's too expensive and it's not very specific. So our goal then is to come up with more specific types of treatments that will impact the dependent person, whereas the abuser will respond to other things. Now, how do we treat the alcoholic? We, re we treat them in inpatient, outpatient, 12-step uh, recovery, and things like that. There are some other things up here that are starting to come online. Alpha, theta, brainwave, biofeedback. There are some studies going on around the nation right now in which the assumption is being, has been made that the alcoholic has a deficiency in alpha, theta brainwaves in their EEG pattern. It seems to be almost diagnostic. That's one of the few things I've seen that, if it's true, seems to be diagnostic of an alcoholic. They have a deficiency of alpha, theta brainwaves. That's a particular brainwave that we don't know what it means. We just notice that quantitatively there's less, less of those brainwaves. So what you do to restore that is you train the person in a biofeedback situation where they're looking at their EEG being projected up on the screen as they're measuring it from their brain and they see some alpha waves, they'll tell the person, okay, think of what you just thought about. Try to get more of those alpha waves back. If they see the theta waves, they'll say, think about what you were just doing. Think about what you were just thinking about. Subconsciously, they can learn to maximize the alpha and theta waves. And they find out that the person remains abstinent longer, has less relapse, and seems to be happier, more relaxed. Alpha theta waves, to most of us, would be an indication of a, of a relaxation posture. Uh, now, what I think is happening when they maximize their alpha theta waves is that they're normalizing those and normalizing their brain chemistry so that the normal alpha theta is an indicator that they are normalizing their brain chemistry. It's another way of treating it. But so far, the alpha theta brainwave biofeedback is only an adjunct. It does not stand alone. It is not a treatment alone. It only is an adjunct to 28, 30-day inpatient treatment. With, it tends to enhance the treatment outcome that we would give people in a 28 to 30 day treatment program. Acupuncture, on the other hand, is starting to come on to its own where it appears like it might be a freestanding treatment. Uh, Michael Smith at Lincoln Hospital in New York uh, started this, and I think he was featured on 60 Minutes one night. The uh, addicts actually come off the street of Manhattan into his clinic when they feel that they're out of control with their heroin, their cocaine, and their alcohol. And they'll ask for the acupuncture needles to be placed in their earlobes, in their earlobes, and uh, they'll sit there for 45 to 60 minutes reading a magazine, and then the needles will be taken out, and they'll walk back out the, on the street, and they're good for another couple of weeks. Uh, and I've, I've talked to Dr. Smith, and I said, I think the mechanism is endorphin release because you can block that effect with naloxone. Naloxone is a is Narcan, it's in a specific opiate blocker. He says, no, he says, that's not the mechanism. And then he walked away and had to catch an airplane, so I never found out what he thought was the mechanism. 
regardless of the mechanism, it seems to work. Acupuncture seems to normalize brain chemistry and is, is so good that it doesn't seem to be necessary to have uh, inpatient or outpatient therapy of any other type. It just seems to be on, stand on its own. Um, that, that the non, let's see. Uh, a, a, oh, there's, uh, there's also a diagnostic test that seems to be coming out that um, shows some promise. It's called CDT, carbohydrate deficient transferrin. It's a chemical that they can find in the blood in a greater quantity in alcoholics than in, in, than in abusers. But the research is still going on, and we don't know what the specificity of that is. If it turns out to be good, it's already marketed by a company. If it turns out to be good, it should be the blood test we've been looking for to differentiate between alcoholics and non-alcoholics, or just heavy drinkers. Okay. I want to mention the genetics of alcoholism right now because uh, we don't have it in any of the controversial topics. The genetics of alcoholism I'll just briefly review. We don't know the genetics of other drug addictions, by the way. There have been less than a dozen studies published on the genetics of drugs of addiction other than alcohol, and the bottom line of all those studies is that if you're the son or daughter of a drug addict, you have an increased chance of becoming a drug addict yourself. This really doesn't tell you very much. But the alcoholism genetics are really where we started to fill in a lot of the details. There have been three types of studies in the genetics of alcoholism. The first is family studies, which have told us two things. First is that generally there's familial and non-familial, two types of alcoholism. Familial, where it runs in families, and non-familial, where it bursts out of nowhere, where there doesn't seem to be any alcoholism in the family. And some doubting Thomases have said there really is no non-familial alcoholism. It's just those families where they don't keep very good records. It's not something that you would write in the family Bible that Aunt Martha is a lush, you know. So. <laughs> So that could be the case. The other thing that the family studies have told us is that if you're the son or daughter of an alcoholic, you have a three to four times greater risk of becoming an alcoholic. What does that mean compared to what? Well, if you take the 6% figure, the general population of alcoholics, if you have a three to four times greater risk, that's 18 to 24% chance of becoming an alcoholic if you have either parent as an alcoholic or either grandparent as an alcoholic. That's called first order relatives. <clears throat> Or if you have a brother or sister that's alcoholic, you have a three to four times greater risk. Then there were some, some twin studies that were done. Twin studies looked at fraternal twins and identical twins. Fraternal twins, I'm sure you know, are they do not share the same genes. They're just as unlike brother and sister as if they were born at different times. And they found that in fraternal twins, when one twin develops a disease, the other twin has a three to four times greater risk, just like if it runs in the family. But when they looked at identical twins, when one twin developed it, the chances of the other twin developing it was 60%, greatly increased, which suggests some genetic linkage, as the geneticists say. And that's regardless of whether the identical twins are male or female and whether the identical twins are raised in the same family or not. Even when they're raised in separate families, you still see that 60% chance. So it seems to be a genetic linkage. The adoption studies, however, were the ones that gave us the best information. These were done in Scandinavia using American money by American scientists. Why do you think they went all the way over to Denmark and Sweden to do these studies? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Actually, it's the records. The, the, the record keeping is, I think I heard somebody say that, the record keeping is a lot better over there. In fact, you, you uh, uh, have to sign in uh, a registry in Denmark if you're an alcoholic in order to get welfare money. But they have church records, state records, family records, they have all kinds of records. So if you're a scientist and you want to do a good study, you want to make sure all the records are there, you go to a place where they're keeping good records. And that's why they went to Denmark and Sweden. There were two scientists, Goodwin and Cloninger, that went over there. Cloninger just replicated his studies of 15 years ago and found the exact same things. And they looked at kids that were adopted out of alcoholic families and out of non-alcoholic families and were raised in, in non-alcoholic or alcoholic families. And here's the bottom line. When they found kids that were now grown up but were adopted out of alcoholic families before the age of six months into non-alcoholic families, these kids had just as great a chance of becoming alcoholic as if they'd stayed in the alcoholic family. Whereas kids that were adopted out of non-alcoholic families into alcoholic families, when they grew up, they had no greater chance of becoming alcoholic than if they'd stayed in the non-alcoholic family. 
So for the first time, they started to separate out genes from environment. Now, it's not correct to say that alcoholism is a genetic disease. That's the wrong terminology. The right terminology is the tendency to become alcoholic is what is inherited. Because that tends to answer a lot of questions that people would have. My father's an alcoholic. Does that mean I'm doomed? No. Only the tendency to become alcoholic is what is inherited. So you're not doomed. Can alcoholism skip generations? Absolutely. Because only the tendency to become alcoholic is what is inherited. And the psychosocial scientists now are the ones who are looking for the environmental and social and psychological triggers that determine whether a person actually shows the disease once they have the genes for it. Every alcoholism, every genetics researcher that I've talked to in this field has stated that there's probably not going to be a single gene disease. It's going to be polygenetic. And so they're looking now, right now, for the genes that are associated with alcoholism. There's a consortium of six laboratories around the nation that have identified 600 alcoholic families multi-generational alcoholic families. They're taking tissue samples from these people, blood, skin, hair, fingernails, looking at the chromosomes that they expect the genes to be found on, and they can chemically chop up the chromosome through what they call molecular biology techniques, and chemically chop up the chromosome and find the abnormal genes. And then once they find those abnormal genes, they can take off the abnormal gene, replace it with a normal one, and get rid of the disease from being transmitted to other generations. Now that's not going to happen tomorrow. It doesn't mean we're going to shut down all the meetings and throw away the big books and uh, close down the inpatient treatment centers. That's going to take 50 to 100 years before we can do that. That's called gene therapy and it is probably the ultimate treatment of this disease by preventing the disease from happening in the first place. They are now, by the way, doing gene therapy in single gene diseases such as Duchenne muscular dystrophy and cystic fibrosis, so it shows that it can be done. Uh, they can manipulate the genes, but uh, they can't manipulate the genes in the sperm and the egg, in the sex chromosomes. That's forbidden research. They can't do that because obviously you have all kinds of manifestations of somebody getting a hold of that technology and creating a race of little Hitlers or something like that. And uh, that's, that's touchy. That's very controversial. So the ultimate treatment of this disease, where we're shooting for is genetic manipulation, but that's going to be a long time in the future. In the meantime, what you'll see is anti-craving drugs, relapse blockers, alpha theta, uh, biofeedback, acupuncture. You'll find some uh, drugs creeping in pretty soon that will tend to correct brain chemistry of individuals so that they won't have the need for the drug, they won't have the loss of control. This is a touchy issue for some people, and we'll talk about it when we talk about controlled drinking. Um, but you'll start to see this progression of treatments. First of all, we're having the real basic anti-craving drugs, and then we'll have other drugs that will be more specific to treat the lesion that causes the need for the drug, and then we'll come up with gene therapy. You'll eventually eradicate the disease, hopefully in the future. How do you respond to the studies that show that there's a higher incidence of alcoholism in certain ethnic cultural groups, and how do you tie that into the... Okay. <laughs> this, the... Uh, the allegations that there's higher incidences of alcoholism in certain ethnic groups, and how do we tie this into that? There have been no studies to indicate that uh, the beliefs that we have of higher incidences of alcoholism in some ethnic groups are true. Now, I tend to play around with audiences sometimes. I'll say, you've all heard that there's a higher incidence of alcoholism in the Native American population. Everybody goes, yeah, yeah. It's never been proven. That's why it's so important to understand this difference between abuse and alcoholism. There's a lot higher drinking in Native American populations, but we don't know whether it's abuse or alcoholism. We know there's a lot higher incidence of fetal alcohol syndrome in the Native American population. That could be just due to heavy consumption of alcohol, not necessarily alcoholism. The studies need to be done, the epidemiological studies need to be done to find the percentage of alcoholics in the Native American population. Is it 16%? Is it 6% like it is in the rest of the population? Or maybe it's only 2% and the rest of it's all abuse. I mean, we can see reasons why the Native Americans would abuse alcohol. That, you know, there's all kinds of misinformation out there, like there's, there's a lower incidence in the Jewish population, there's a lower incidence in the Orientals, there's a high incidence in the Irish. Nobody's ever proven that. But it's anecdotal. We tend to believe it because so many people say it. It's never been proven. So uh, if, however, 
there is a lower incidence in the Orientals compared to the Irish, why don't we look at the Orientals for the protective factor for the alcoholism? Nobody's doing that. It would be a very interesting thing to do. There was a study that came out in the New Zealand Medical Journal within the last six months indicating that the Maoris, the, the uh, native New Zealanders, have a low rate of alcoholism and that they have a, they've identified the gene that protects them from alcoholism. Wouldn't that be fun to do if we could do that in the Orientals or in the Jewish population, if that happens to be true, that they have a lower incidence of alcoholism? So there's a lot of possibilities for genes and uh, for gene studies, and those are going on hot and, he hot and heavy right now. There's $25 million being given to that work by the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism. Um, are you the one who brought up the genetics that asked the question? Did I satisfy your question? Yeah. Okay. All right, then uh, assessments. <clears throat> who asked that question? Yeah, what was the question again? Okay. Uh, I think I like what most people at least wish for in this field or some kind of lay uh, tools to to know which way to go at times. But the two right now which seem to be having the most impact, three. Uh, the addiction severity index is a is a good pencil and paper one. It takes about ten minutes or so. And uh, I'm gonna be interviewing the man who made that uh, next week. The next one is the SASI, the Sub Substance Abuse Subtle Screening Inventory. That seems to be pretty good. I know the person who made that one. And then the MMPI piled on top of either one of those seems to be helpful. You have to use a battery of tests. Not one will work alone. Although the criminal justice system, I think, is using just one right now. I think traditionally that these tests, or in recent times, these tests have been given at least adolescents by persons who had a vested interest uh, in, in giving the third. Yeah. Unfortunately, we can't get away from the politics of some of this stuff. Okay. Before we finish today, I want to talk about this idea of culpability. That uh, I know is very important to you. All right, let's go on to some controversial issues. Controlled drinking is not a logical treatment outcome for alcoholics. Uh, that statement in itself is... Um, is not controversial. But what I was talking about earlier is controversial. If we could come up with a magic bullet to correct brain chemistry in an alcoholic, does that mean that they could go back to social drinking? The answer is yes. Because what you would do is you would make it so that the neurochemistry no longer is driving the loss of control. They would have a normal neurochemistry, and yes, they could go back to social drinking or controlled drinking. Now, the other question is, is that a logical outcome for someone whose life has been racked by alcoholism? Would someone like to do that? Some would, some probably wouldn't. It's an empty calorie, toxic substance, which some people wouldn't want to touch for the rest of their lives. Other people would say, yeah, I'd love to have a glass of champagne at my daughter's wedding, or I'd love to have a, a can of Miller Lite after a softball game or something like that. And they could if their chemistry had been corrected. But that's a philosophical, ethical, moral issue that we don't have to deal with right now because the magic bullet has not been found, and it's not likely that it will be found in the next 20 or 30 years. For it to be found, what we would have to do is to find a separate drug for each of the neurochemical deficits. And uh, the, the, pro the chances of finding a specific drug with very few side effects that was non-addicting, very difficult. It's a very difficult pharmacological uh, problem. So I know this is a very emotional issue with respect to recovering people who say that abstinence is their only goal for the rest of their life. And I tend to believe that that's the case right now, is abstinence is the only goal. Uh, so this is something we shouldn't have to worry about, but it is emotional on the part of a lot of recovering people. Oh, there have been some reports uh, before in, in uh, research literature to indicate that some people can go back to controlled drinking if you look at the methodology of those reports, I believe they had some abusers mixed in with the alcoholics, and that's what happened, is that those people who could go back to controlled drinking probably were not alcoholic in the first place. If you look at the old Sobel studies and the Rand report, uh, their methodology was not good enough to be able to sort out 
at the, many years ago. They couldn't sort out abusers from alcoholics. It's another good reason for keeping this distinction between abusers and alcoholics. I don't think that alcoholics these days can go back to controlled drinking. I'm not aware of that. But abusers can. <clears throat> Nutrisecond, the few seconds of pleasure before the aftertaste of a diet drink sets in. <laughs> Been experiencing that myself up here. Measures to reduce alcohol mis do not, misuse do not affect alcoholism. We've already touched on this. Misuse and alcoholism, the treatments are different. Misuse is education, coercion, social pressure, and incarceration, whereas alcoholism requires intensive multidimensional therapy, which causes gradual improvement over time. Therefore, alcohol misuse can be reduced by decreasing availability, increasing cost, raising the drinking age, raising the awareness, and tougher dr drunk driving laws. But these measures do not stop an alcoholic. I think you have to keep that in mind. It's these measures just will not have any impact on an alcoholic whatsoever. But we've really already covered that. Chalk to see, the, jo the joy of discovering a second layer of chocolates underneath the first. <laughs> How many of you have heard of the tetrahydroisoquinolin theory? OK, just a few of you. Uh, it's no longer a major theory in the field, and some people always ask me why, so I put a couple of slides in here. For those of you who do not know what the TIQ theory is, this was started in 1970 at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. The theory essentially said that in people who drink alcohol, they form metabolites of alcohol and neurotransmitters in the brain called tetrahydroisoquinolins. And these are formed when alcohol, uh, the breakdown product of ac alcohol called acetaldehyde, interacts with certain neurotransmitters such as serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine to cause these TIQs, and that's what drives the drinking in the alcoholic. And, and that was a very controversial theory for several years, but it was taught in treatment centers as one of the causes of alcoholism because it seemed to track with the alcoholic's feeling that when they drank, they were producing something in their brain that caused them to lose control. Well, the TIQs are similar to opiates. They, they actually have an opiate-like pharmacology so the hypothesis said that the alcoholic is not addicted to alcohol any, at, at, in any case. They're addicted to opiates, which are the TIQs that are formed in their brains. And uh, we now have the ability to measure TIQs in the body, which we didn't for the first uh, 10 years of the theory. But they cannot consistently be found in alcoholics versus controls. There are only about four laboratories around the world still working on this. Every once in a while, you'll see a sporadic publication coming out. But um, new research on these substances really has not shown anything to indicate that these TIQs occur in alcoholics versus non-alcoholics. So the theory has essentially died. That's why you didn't see TIQs listed in my list of neurotransmitters that were deficient or in excess earlier. The dopamine, serotonin, endorphins, and, and GABA are the only four right now, not the TIQs. Slubers, remnants of soap too small to use but too big to throw away. I've learned how to save those, by the way. You can just squish them onto a new bar and uh, let them sit overnight, and they kind of melt together, and then you haven't lost anything. They just you continue to use them over and over again. <clears throat> Addicting drugs can be given to recovering drug addicts. This is controversial. It's at least controversial to me because 15 years ago when I first talked to an Al-Anon group and I suggested we may have drugs someday to treat alcoholism, I almost got thrown out of the room. And, and that's because of this, uh, this old AA tradition that says uh, we don't want any drugs being used in our bodies at all for the rest of our lives once we're abstinent. And I respect that. I couldn't understand 15 years ago how people would think that, but now uh, I can respect that particular philosophy for those people who, once they get off an addicting drug, need to stay off that drug for the rest of their lives. On the other hand, what we're finding now is more and more instances of situations where Recovering alcoholics or recovering drug addicts get into situations where they need to have a drug for the treatment of a certain disease. And what the recovering person needs to know is that not all drugs that affect the brain are addicting. There are some situations where you can take drugs that are not addicting. One drug that's not addicting that affects the brain is Dilantin. Dilantin is an anti-epileptic drug. I don't know of any epileptic that's using Dilantin that says, give me more, give me more, I can't stop, I can't stop. It's not an addicting drug. But yet it works very well in the central nervous system. Another class of drugs that's not addicting is the antipsychotic drugs, the 
major tranquilizers such as Thorazine and Haldol, those drugs are not addicting. They're used in psycho uh, psychotic patients, schizophrenics, and they're n they've never been shown to be addicting. Even in non-schizophrenics, they're not addicting. One of the problems with their lack of addiction is that they take about three to four weeks to exert their effect, and no self-respecting drug addict wants to wait three to four weeks to get a high. You know. So, And antidepressants are not addicting either. They're abused, but they're not addicting. So, many people in recovery adhere to a policy of no drug use, and these Dilantin, Thorazine, and Prozac are not addicting. We're going to talk in some detail about Prozac later. <coughs> Valium is today used in the detox of alcoholics. Fifteen years ago, this would have been forbidden. This would, no self-respecting alcoholic would ever let themselves have Valium be given for detox because of the fear of becoming addicted to Valium. And the best way now to use Valium in detox is which, what the treatment centers do, is they give a bolus injection of Valium intramuscularly, and that releases over a 12 to 24 hour period so that the person who is getting the Valium just fe feels comfortable. They don't go through DTs, they don't go through withdrawal, they just are very comfortable during that period of time and they never get into the habit of popping a Valium every four to six hours and become addicted to it. So Valium is now routinely used in detox, and I know some physicians working in treatment centers who've never seen a case of DTs because of this. Never, ever. They don't even know what DTs looks like. They've never seen it because they give Valium routinely, or, or Librium, another benzodiazepine. Recovering alcoholics and other drug addicts can be given morphine after surgery to reduce pain without risk of opiate addiction. The question is why? We're starting to see more and more instances where recovering alcoholics go into a hospital and maybe they have hip replacement surgery or they have uh, major surgery and they will, they will use an opiate while they're in a the hospital and they come out, doesn't cause them to go into relapse with alcohol, doesn't cause them to become addicted to the opiates, and they don't know why. But one of the things we're starting to see is that addicting drugs used in a treatment setting, particularly in a hospital, causes a lot lower incidence of addiction than we used to predict. And so now we're tending to use opiates much more freely in the treatment of pain in hospitalized patients than we used to because over time they just found that the chances of addiction are much, much lower. In fact, you see some patients sitting in the hospital pressing a button to give themselves as much morphine as they want up to a certain point so that they don't go into respiratory depression. They can have all they want, so they don't have to keep calling the nurse or the doctor for another shot of morphine. They can just titrate it into themselves. There are also more and more reports coming out from recovering alcoholics that are really interesting to me. I, I know, a re, uh, I have a friend who's in recovery, and he told me a couple of interesting things. We went on a hike together for two hours one afternoon, and he, he started telling me, I would, he was talking to me about spirituality. He was a priest. And I was talking to him about the neurochemistry of alcoholism. So we were both learning from each other. And it turned out he was recovering. And he said he became an alcoholic because he, was, he had ADD, attention deficit uh, disorder. And he couldn't sleep at night. So he was drinking a lot of alcohol to put himself to sleep. And he lost control. And he had to go to AA to, uh, to get off the alcohol. And then he said, but interestingly enough, I took Vicodin for shingles. Shingles is a very painful viral condition. And he said, I took Vicodin. And I said, you mean you didn't get addicted to it? And he says, no. He says, I used it. Pain went away. When the shingles went away, I stopped using Vicodin. I was never hooked on it. He says, it didn't throw me back into my alcohol drinking. I said, that's against what I've always heard. He says, well, it happened to me. I said, what about some other drugs that you may have used? I said, what about cocaine? He says, oh, cocaine, the nectar of the gods. He said, that's fantastic, great drug. I said, you mean you're... At you're addicted to cocaine? He says, no, I won't use it. Why not? He says, because it makes my heart pound too fast. So in his particular case, he never got addicted to cocaine, even though he liked it. He didn't lose control, but he had lose, lost control over alcohol. And he says, can you explain that to me? And I said, well, I'll take a stab at it. I think that in your brain, the part of your brain and the medial forebrain bundle that caused you to lose control over alcohol was the one that had the deficient neurotransmitter, but your part of your brain were the opiates and the cocaine act, that was okay. That, that's functioning okay. So you are specifically addicted to one drug, but can't get addicted to other drugs. Now you see the neurochemistry and the neuroanatomy starts to tell us 
why some of these strange things happen. And just as soon as I start to tell recovering audiences this, and I talk to a lot of recovering audiences during the year, I get more and more reports of people who come up and they say, yeah, you're exactly right. Boy, I used to use Vicodin like crazy after I had my teeth extracted, but I never got addicted to Vicodin, and it never threw me back into my alcoholism. So these reports are starting to come out, which gives me the ammunition to go to some of my scientist friends and say, examine this. I wonder why it is. Let's make sure that we're understanding this medial forebrain bundle function a little bit more. And I think that's really healthy for the scientists to talk to the recovering people and people who are working with the recovering people to try to get new hypotheses to test. That's the only way we're going to move ahead. <coughs> Asper Bayer Pair Perfection, the ability to always extract exactly two headache tablets from the bottle. You see that in commercials, you know, tap, tap, and two aspirin come out. I always wondered how they did that. I always get three whenever I try to do that. Methadone is a poor treatment for opiate addiction. This is another controversial issue. It's my feeling that many methadone treatment centers are poorly run, that uh, unless they are well controlled, that they are a waste of state and federal money. Um, I believe that the basis of the methadone treatment centers is faulty. The theory behind the methadone treatment center is, it started out to be, that what you do is you replace a person's heroin habit or heroin addiction with methadone, which supposedly is a lot less addicting and causes a lot less severe withdrawal symptoms. You talk to people running methadone clinics and they say, oh my God, the methadone withdrawal is a lot worse than morphine or heroin. Uh, I'm not exactly sure why pharmacologically it should not be the case. Methadone gives you a lot more prolonged withdrawal and is a lot less uncomfortable. So when you withdraw people, you can step them down with methadone and get them off of it, and supposedly they go off merrily on their way. Unfortunately, it doesn't happen that way because what happens is that heroin addicts often will go back to their drug even after they've been detoxed. All you have to do is talk to physicians who've been trying to get people off of heroin. They'll step them down on heroin or they'll put them on methadone and step them down. And two weeks later, the heroin addict is back in their office, full-blown, fully tolerant, taking five grams of heroin a day. And so they say, well, you did it again, Charlie. I'll have to get you off of it again. So they step them down real nicely so they don't go through this, this unbearable withdrawal. And... Uh, Two weeks later, they're back in their office again. And finally, some physicians will say, darn it, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you off, take you off cold turkey. I'm going to show you. You can't die from opiate withdrawal. So they just let them go to cold turkey for 48 hours. They go through hell, you know, the fetal position, the cramping, the sweating, and all of this sort of stuff that you saw in the man with a golden arm with Frank Sinatra. Very, very uncomfortable. See, so we'll teach you. Maybe you'll never go back to that if you have to do that. Two weeks later, they're back in on their heroin again. So... What methadone clinics turn out to be is babysitting services. And they maintain the person on methadone. And in many cases, what happens is when the person can't get their heroin, they'll come in for their methadone. They go along with their methadone. They get heroin. They'll jump to heroin. And then when they can't get their heroin, they'll come back again and they'll go on to morph morphine. So they end up just being maintenance places for heroin abusers. Now, the good methadone clinics will, will have a lot of criteria associated with it to make sure that they're doing the right job. They'll have drug screens. They'll make sure the person is having a job so that they're not, they're not having to go out and steal to get money for their drug. They'll have therapy going on to prepare the person to getting off the drug eventually. And, and so they'll have all those things in place. But there are very few good methadone clinics that do all of those. And so that, I think that methadone clinics uh, is really a poor treatment for opiate addiction. Now, heroin use is on the rise, if you haven't heard in the United States. And we're going to have to come up with better treatments for, for heroin addiction than we have right now. There's Narcotics Anonymous, which I think will be helpful. There's some of these newer therapies like acupuncture, the biofeedback, which will probably kick in. Um, some of the older therapies like uh, methadone is not very good. Naltrexone is a possibility. Naltrexone is an opiate antagonist. It blocks the receptor for heroin so that when a person takes heroin, they don't get the high. And eventually they just say, ah, to hell with it, I can't get high anymore. But that requires them to take the, the uh, naltrexone. Um, there have been other treatments such as LAM, L-A-A-M, which is a long-acting form of methadone. That doesn't seem to catch on either. So we have to, we're going to have to come up with some better treatments, otherwise the heroin addiction is just going to go through the roof. Uh, 
Illuminat, device in airplane bathrooms that won't let the light come on until you lock the door. Often wondered what that was called. This is a major misconception. Crack is not more addicting than cocaine. Let me explain what, what I mean here. There's two things that we hear from the street crack addicts. Number one is that crack is faster acting than cocaine given intravenously. Number two, that crack is more addicting. I don't believe either one of those things. Pharmacolo pharmacologically, I just don't understand why they would be saying that. I think I know what they're saying, but what they're saying is different what the, than what they mean. Just think of it. If you give cocaine intravenously, what happens, assuming you're pushing the plunger nice and smoothly, is you're getting a smooth flow of cocaine, goes through the heart, it's pumped up to the brain. That's pretty fast. It goes right in, you're putting it right into the blood. When you, when you smoke crack, crack goes into the nose, down the nasal passages and the trachea, into the lungs, across a one-cell membrane in the alveoli, into the blood, through the heart, and up to the brain. Seems to me that cannot be faster than putting it directly into the blood. I think what the crack addicts are telling us is that it's a different type of feeling that they get with crack. Because some recent research coming out of the National Institute on Drug Abuse Intramural Research Program in Baltimore, Maryland, has told us that when a, a crack user smokes, what they get is bullet-like bursts of cocaine hitting the brain. They'll take a puff, it'll go down, it'll, be, it'll go through the alveoli, through the heart, up to the brain, it'll hit the brain, bang, like that. And then you take another puff and you get another bang. So it's like bullet-like bursts. And that's a different sensation than you get with just a nice smooth flow of cocaine up to the brain. It's not faster, it's just different. But they're both real fast. They're both within seconds. So I'm not even sure that a crack addict could tell the difference in the speed of the way, the, way the, the drug hits the brain. But it's a different type, which probably they like better. It's, it's bang, 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 rather than just a smooth feeling. So I think what they're saying is that they like the high from crack more than cocaine intravenously. Now they say that crack is more addicting than cocaine. Why? It's the same drug. Remember, addiction is impaired control. It has nothing to do with the euphoria. It has nothing to do with the craving. It's the need for the drug. They're the same drug. Why should it be different? What they're saying is there are more crack addicts out there. The reason there are more crack addicts is there are more users and abusers of crack because it's cheaper, easier to make, and more easily, more readily accessible. And any time you have a large population of users, and let's say that there's a 12% incidence of, of addiction, there's going to be more addicts than if you have a small population and there's 12% of those. So we're seeing more crack addicts. That doesn't mean it's more addicting. We just, mean, we, we just mean that there are more people addicted to it. Does that make sense? Okay. So be aware of what people tell you. You've got to kind of examine it because pharmacologically it doesn't make sense that crack should be more addicting than cocaine. It's the same drug. And freebase is not more addicting than cocaine. And crack is not more addicting than freebase. It has to do with availability and the ability to manufacture it. What is the percentage of addiction of people who use cocaine who become addicted? Does anyone know? No one knows. It's never been measured. Wouldn't it be nice if you could tell your kids, son, if you use cocaine, the chances of you becoming addicted are 95%. Wouldn't it be nice if you could say something like that? The triennial report to Congress from the National Institute on Drug Abuse in 1992 placed the addiction liability to cocaine at 16 to 17 percent. That seems very low to me. The chances of becoming alcoholic if you drink alcohol are 10 percent. We know that one in 10 people who drink alcohol become alcoholic. We don't have any idea what the percentage of people who use cocaine are who become addicted to cocaine. If you look at the numbers coming out of the 1-800-COCAINE hotline in New Jersey, 85% of the people who call in say they're out of control with cocaine. But I think that's abnormally high because it would be only the people who are in trouble calling that 800 hotline. So the accuracy of our ability to measure cocaine addiction is somewhere between 16 and 85%. That's not very good, is it? Um, we don't even know the percentage of people who smoke nicotine cigarettes who become addicted. 
I heard someone say it was 60%, but that's uh, not a controlled study. It would be nice to be able to say to Mary Jean, if you smoke cigarettes, the chances of you becoming addicted are 60%. It would be nice to have those figures. We need more research on that. <clears throat> Eknaluma, a rescue vehicle which can only be seen in the rearview mirror. Now that's going to take a little thought. Ambulance spelled backwards, if you a little slow there. Do you know there's no such thing as crack babies? And now you're going to say, well, Dr. Erickson, you've lost me now because I've seen crack babies. See, people who have seen crack babies really haven't seen crack babies. What's actually happened is that in the early 1980s, I remember seeing editorials that were published in major medical journals like the Journal of American Medical Association, New England Journal of Medicine, editorials started popping up with physicians saying, I just treated a woman who smoked cocaine, who smoked crack during pregnancy, and she had a baby with an incompletely formed skull. just thought my colleagues would like to know that. And then another editorial with a physician that says, yeah, I just treated three women who used cocaine and crack during pregnancy, and their babies were all abnormal. One was had spina bifida, another one had an incompletely formed skull, and another one had an incompletely formed brain. You see, those, those anecdotal reports started to pop up in the medical literature, and what that, hap what, caused, what that caused to happen is that scientists started to look at that in some controlled fashion. And the early reports, interestingly enough, said, yes, women who use cocaine have abnormal babies. But they were not very well controlled studies because what they failed to do is to go back and find out what else those women were using. And now what we have found is that women who have crack babies are also women who use alcohol, they smoke during pregnancy, they have poor prenatal care, and they're poorly nourished. So the babies shouldn't be called crack babies, they should be called polydrug abused, poor prenatal, poor nutrition babies rather than crack babies. And try, try to find a woman who only uses crack during pregnancy, it's almost impossible. Yeah. So uh, when they did find women, and it took a long period of time, when they did find women who only used co cocaine during pregnancy, nothing was wrong with the kids. And animal studies where they pumped animals with huge doses of cocaine, nothing happened to the pups, the, uh, the babies. So you don't have to believe me. Um, there was a review in 1993 written by Hutchings who essentially said what I just said, and, and uh, that was a review of all the scientific and clinical literature that he could find. And it was so controversial at the time. This was in a major teratology journal, and, and you can read these. They're in your handout. This was in a major teratology journal that the editor decided to have some other experts commenting on that review, and two other experts said... Day and Richardson said, it's clear that it's extremely difficult to separate the effects of prenatal cocaine exposure from other detrimental factors, including a lifestyle that includes other substance use, poor nutrition, and in many cases, poverty and a lack of medical care. Many of the early crack babies were identified in mothers who came out of the inner cities, who, uh, when they use high doses of cocaine, automatically have poor prenatal care. I mean, if you're on a high all the time, why would you go in and have prenatal care? You don't you have no reason to think that there'd be anything wrong with your baby. Furthermore, someone said, you're using cocaine, you ought to get some prenatal care. They say, no, oh, everything's fine, my baby's going to be great, because they're on a high all the time. So there's no reason for them to get prenatal care. And then Claire Coles in Atlanta titled her editorial saying goodbye to the crack baby. She was mad. The hysteria and poorly considered reactions of both professionals and the public, and she should have said, and the media, have made the crack baby for years an embarrassing episode. Children have been labeled with the pejorative term crack baby, and it's not difficult to believe that this label will affect attitudes toward them in negative ways in the future. So that indicates that being labeled as a crack baby could be really detrimental to a kid as they're growing up. And I tend to agree with that. Flop corn, the unpopped kernels at the bottom of the cooker. I used to call them old maids. <clears throat> Nicotine addiction is worse than marijuana addiction. Does anyone disagree with that? Okay. Well, let me just explain what I mean here. Anecdotal evidence indicates many non-addicted smokers can stop cold turkey with no problem. Again, with this uh, group of nurses that I was telling you about earlier, 
I said, is there anyone in the audience who was able to stop cold turkey smoking uh, cigarettes, cold turkey, the first time they tried? And about 10% of the audience raised their hands, these nurses. And these were not nurses who worked with addicted patients. 10% raised their hand. And what I did is I said, let's give them a round of applause. So everybody clapped and everything. And I said, I always like to acknowledge the nicotine abusers in the audience. <laughs> And they said, what? And I said, well, if you were able to stop the first time cold turkey, you weren't addicted. And a lady down in Houston one time, when I did that, uh, got very irate. And she said, do you mean to tell me, Dr. Erickson, after I smoked two packs of cigarettes for 20 years and I was able to stop cold turkey that I was not addicted? And I said, yep, that's right. I'm trying to make a point. You were not addicted. You were an abuser. And she says, I was too addicted. <laughs> and I said, how do you know? And she says, because my friend told me I was. <laughs> And, and I said, well, no, you really weren't because, you see, you were able to stop the first time. And the definition, this is not a too much, too often disease. It's an I can't stop disease. Now, people who have tried to stop cold turkey 12 times or so, uh, they're the ones that are probably addicted. And then you get into these hair splitters. They say, well, well I tried to stop three times and I couldn't have. You know, it doesn't matter at that point. It's You've got to get off of smoking because it's so dangerous. So... Anecdotal evidence that indicates that many non-addictive smokers can stop cold turkey with no problem. Government studies indicate that about 80% of smokers want to stop, but each year fewer than 1 in 10 actually succeeds. That's a pretty hefty addiction, it seems to me, that, that 1 in 10 who want to are able to succeed. Now, if you look at smoking cessation te techniques, uh, there, are, there are at least 20 smoking cessation therapies out there. And some people die addicted. These are the people who will smoke through their trach tube, you know, after they have had surgery for lung cancer. Or people who have had quadruple bypass surgery and they insist on smoking after and they know that the smoking is what caused them to have the heart disease. Um, and there are some people who die and never get treatment for smoking. Sparse studies indicate that marijuana addiction is labeled as moderate. Remember that Monty said that I published a book in, the 19, in 1990 uh, that the, the title was Relative Addiction Liabilities of Various Drugs and Drug Classes. Um, nicotine was placed in a uh, high category of, of uh, addiction, whereas marijuana was placed in a moderate category in users of more than five joints per day. But we don't have enough research on marijuana. so. What I'm saying here is something that stands as of the information that we have today. New research coming out of marijuana may indicate that it's much more addicting than we think it is right now. There are no established serious adverse consequences of long-term use of marijuana. Marijuana, pharmacologically, is a very safe drug. It doesn't rot your liver, your heart, your brain, like alcohol does. And it doesn't cause lung cancer and heart disease like nicotine does. That has nothing to do with addiction. That's just a kind of a... Uh, a pharmacological observation. Uh, some people say, well, marijuana has 15 times the tars and the other things in it per joint compared to cigarette smoke, and there are studies that indicate that. My comeback to that is that very few people smoke two packs of joints, marijuana joints, a day. Uh, so that it kind of tends to balance it out. Are we suggesting legalization or decriminalization here? No, I don't, I don't think we need another drug out there that's going to screw up our driving skills like <laughs> marijuana would do. So uh, it's just my opinion based upon looking at all the research literature as of that 1990 book that nicotine addiction is far worse than marijuana addiction. Those of you working with marijuana addicts may tend to disagree with that, and that's why it's controversial. Pastaplegic, the person who's eaten so much spaghetti he can't move. <laughs> There's a significant placebo effect in addiction treatment. This is, this is uh, not real controversial. It, it indicates a problem in the field. People who are treating addicts know that treatment works. The, the, we hear this term, treatment works. The problem is it's very difficult to prove that treatment works to the federal government, to those people who need to give us insurance money for treatment coverage, to the managed care providers and so forth. We, we have a hard time showing that. The placebo effect in the general population is 30 to 35 percent. Regardless of what treatment you give anybody, 30 to 35 percent will respond positively to that treatment, whether it be surgery, uh, a, glass, uh, a cup of liquid red 
substance that you give people and you say that's an appetite stimulant, it, it's just sugar water, but their appetite will be stimulated because you suggested it would. The 30, 35% placebo effect is, is universal through the uh, treatments for addiction or for anything else. Some controlled outcome studies that have been done by inpatient treatment centers, for-profit treatment centers, indicate the treatment effectiveness of 60% or more. That's over a long-term. Parkside recently did a study that showed 60% sobriety three years out in the patients that they treated in 28-day treatments. And it was a very well-done study. The problem is that they failed to subtract the 30% placebo responders out of that. So the government is aware of that, and so they say, ah, the treatment studies are only 30%, only shows 30% effectiveness. You've got to subtract out that placebo effect. And that's, that's dangerous. That's nasty. Anecdotal reports indicate some alcoholics stop drinking on their own or without continued attendance at AA meetings. That's what I was talking about earlier. I think that those are not alcoholics. Those are probably um, the abusers that have been misdiagnosed. And so much more treatment is needed in order to uh, determine the actual treatment effectiveness uh, of the treatment centers that we have or the treatment goals that we have. Tack angle, the position of one's head while biting into a taco. <laughs> the 12 steps track with theories of the causes of alcoholism. I, I think I already covered this. What we're talking about is that AA causes people to be able to access their own brain chemistry. Never been proven. That's only speculation. Please keep that in mind. I've had some recovering people say, Carl, that's exactly right. As soon as I got done with step one, I admitted powerlessness over the drug. I knew there was a huge neurochemical change in my body. Uh, and not only that, they come up and they say, I know which, which chemical it was. It was endorphins. I'm sure it was endorphins. I say, well, we've got to be able to measure that sometime. I appreciate you're agreeing with me, but sometime we have, we're going to have to be able to measure that. Uh, so this just goes through what I, what I went through earlier about the low levels of neurotransmitters and how we can bring them back up into normal with uh, this, this emotional, gut-wrenching, reconditioning process that we call the 12 steps. <clears throat> Burgatory, the place where unsold burgers go when the stand shuts down for the night. And those are the ones they bring out at 11 o'clock the next morning. Drug abuse, uh, this is a favorite topic of mine. And we have two more controversial issues to go, but this is one of my favorite topics because this is going to impact all of our lives for the next decade at least. Drug abuse might be prevented through what we call cosmetic psychopharmacology. How many of you have read Peter Kramer's book on um, listening to Prozac? Any of you read that? You ought to if you haven't. It's a, it's a bestseller. Peter Kramer's book called Listening to Prozac, and there's another one that's come out to counter it called Talking Back to Prozac. Um, and it essentially is summarized in the next slides that I have. Prozac is a very interesting model. This is the way that Prozac is being prescribed by physicians today for these purposes as an antidepressant for panic disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder. Remember I mentioned obesity earlier. Excessive sensitivity to criticism, fear of rejection, lack of self-esteem, and inability to experience pleasure. Heck, I should have had Prozac this morning when I woke up. You know, I, Talking about controversial issues, I might have some lack of self-esteem or a lack of self-confidence and that I might be attacked by the audience and then I don't want to feel bad, so I should take my Prozac. There are physicians and psychiatrists out there right now writing prescriptions for people who say, I can't put up with this low self-esteem anymore. I've got to feel better. Now, a man by the name of Barandi, Samuel Barandi, a pharmacologist in California, wrote a two-page article called um, Thinking About Prozac. And he's the one who listed these. It appeared in a journal called Science, and the, the reference is at the bottom of this slide. And Dr. Barandi's brought up some interesting philosophical questions that no one knows the answer to, but the things that we ought to think about. Can Prozac replace psychotherapy? Are all of the uses on the previous slide indicative of a common underlying problem? That is, not enough serotonin. Is it an expensive placebo? Since it's been written up in Time Magazine and Newsweek and Reader's Digest, people expect it to have an effect, and at $2 a pop, it might be an expensive placebo. 
Are the changes lasting? Must the drug be taken forever? Interesting philosophical questions. An article in New Republic by Robert Wright last year, and I think maybe earlier this year, which was called something like the happiness principle. Uh, he talks about insurance providers paying for everyone to get Prozac so that we can reduce our discomfort, our uncomfortable feelings, and that we ought to maybe put it in the drinking water. Think of that. Prozac has caused a shift in the way that psychotherapists view behavioral disorders in their treatment. I've talked to psychotherapists who say that their patients come in and they say, their patients say, I don't want any more of this one hour a week, 52 weeks a year for two years, and I haven't gotten any better talking to you. I want my Prozac. And they insist on the psychotherapist referring them to a psychiatrist that will prescribe Prozac for them so they'll feel better now. They don't want to wait for two years. And the, and the psychotherapists are sitting back there saying, what are we doing? You know, it, it, these people are wanting Prozac. Can Prozac replace psychotherapy? Let me give you my opinion. And, and I'll just, this is the way I feel right now. It may change in a couple of months. I think we need both Prozac and psychotherapy because we see a lot of people who get so depressed that they can't respond to psychotherapy. The Prozac will bring them up out of their deep, dark hole of depression so that they can then listen to the psychotherapist and, and, and the Prozac does not get rid of the basic underlying problem. It just covers it over so that they feel better. But then if they happen to have to get off the Prozac, that basic underlying problem will come back again. So I think you need both of them working together. An interesting thing that I do is, is I'll play around with some psychotherapist friends who don't know much about neurochemistry. Most psychologists these days know something about neurochemistry. But every once in a while, I'll find a psychotherapist who says, no, psychology is the answer. So I'll say something like this. When you're treating someone who has poor self-esteem and has had a major crisis in their life, what do you do? And they'll say something like, well, we, ch we uh, talk to them about their, their childhood. We find out where their wounding occurred. We find out whether they've been brought up in a dysfunctional family or a substance abuse family. And then we treat them. And I'll say, well, what do you do? And they'll say, well, we change their psychology. And I'll say, what do you do? And they say, what do you mean? I say, we change their psychology. We, we get them to admit that there is something wrong in their childhood, and we get them to cry an awful lot about it, and then we give them affirmations that they are supposed to say every day, and they get better after that. And I say, what do you do? <laughs> after a while, they think that I'm just a parrot. I keep saying, what do you do? And they say, what do you mean? And I say, well, when you're changing these things, what's happening in their brain? Oh, I see what you mean, Carl. We're setting up new pathways, and we're getting rid of old pathways. The, the harmful pathways, we're trying to get them to forget those, and we're setting up new positive pathways. I say, okay, if that works, what are you doing? I say, what do you mean? I just told you what we're doing. I say, no, is there any chemistry in the brain? I say, oh, yeah, when we set up new pathways and get rid of old ones, we're changing chemistry. Now you got it. So psychotherapy, now they're starting to say, if, if a drug can come along and do the same thing that they take a long, long time to do, not quite as effectively, but it takes them a long time, maybe their psychotherapy is changing brain chemistry and that's how the person gets better. Is that a possibility? I say, yeah, I never thought of that. So, you see what we're talking about here is we're talking about changing people's emotions, their mood, their behavior with a drug that has few side effects. From what we can tell, Prozac's been, about, been out about eight years now, no serious significant side effects on the liver, on the brain, on the heart, anything like that. Prozac is in what we call the big American clinical experiment right now. The drug company will release a drug into the American population after a few clinical studies, but then only after a long period of time do the reports of side effects start to come in. We haven't seen that with Prozac. Zoloft, a drug after Prozac, has even fewer side effects, at least acute side effects, and a new drug called Paxil it's just been out for a few months. We don't know exactly what that's going to do. But if we come up with a drug with few side effects, non-addicting, that tends to make people feel better, what's the philosophy behind that of giving it to a large group of people that may feel better and we all might live happily ever after? Now, I, each one of you is going to have a different opinion as to whether that's good or not. We don't have time to sample all of you. But what, what we're saying, what I've heard from other people is they say, well, you're going to make us all the same? 
Uh, what about art? You know, sometimes art comes through pain, and, and a, a good painter never really expresses himself or herself unless they felt pain and they can put it on the canvas. What about some of the great concertos that have been written in the past because the composer was in pain? We'd, we'd, we'd lose all of that. And people can counter that by saying, well, what about the people who were so depressed they couldn't write a song? We, we're losing those people, and we've got to get people up to... <laughs> you know, you could, you could argue it all day, but it's going to be a major philosophical and medical discussion point for the next decade at least. Now, more uh, closely at home with, with people in the criminal justice system, there's an awful lot of research going on right now to indicate that people who are impulsive and aggressive have low levels of brain serotonin. They have just cloned uh, the gene in a mouse strain. They can, they can pull out a gene in a mouse strain that leads to the production of the receptor site for serotonin in the brains of the mice. And they find these mice are highly aggressive because they're lacking the serotonin receptor. This goes along with a lot of research to indicate that serotonin is somehow involved in aggression. And therefore, perhaps, violence in inner cities. Now think about that. If we can correct brain chemistry in people who are violent, particularly when they're, the, when they're under the influence of addicting drugs, which tend to lower brain serotonin, does that indicate how we might be able to correct some of the violence? Do we dare talk about that, or should we just shut it down? There was a major international conference scheduled for uh, Washington, D.C. in early March of this year, which was canceled because of the contradictory nature of what I just said. The government didn't want to talk about it. Which part of it? The mice or the, or the serotonin? or? Okay. Ser Prozac increases serotonin. It's a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, as I showed you earlier. There are some people who are suggesting that maybe we ought to provide Prozac to those people who tend to be aggressive when they use addicting drugs so that we can reduce violence and get rid of a lot of the crime in our society. I, I would like to take a few minutes and find out what you all think about that. I mean, should, should we not talk about it, or should we talk about it and come to some conclusion, or should we put our best minds in Washington on it and come up with a law? How are we going to handle something like this? Yes, sir. Okay. Harry Truman said that truth is the result of the clash of minds and ideas that is constantly going on. We shouldn't be afraid of the truth. We shouldn't be afraid of talking about this. Is that what you're saying? Okay. Have we not found natural sources of things like lithium before in certain areas? There are some anecdotal reports that lithium occurs in the drinking water of some cities and that there is a lower incidence of violence in those cities. Anecdotal? I don't know. Yes, sir. Are you saying that all these people have that same mental problem? Okay, because, because we're seeing a lot of our violence in a certain uh, segment of the population, are we saying that all those people have that, that same mental problem? Well, think of this. Those same people are the ones who are using most of the drugs. The drugs may be the ones that are causing the changes in brain chemistry that could then be corrected that way. So you either have to do one thing. You either have to get the drugs out of their hands to reduce the changes in the brain chemistry, or you have to give them something to correct the brain chemistry that's been altered by drugs. And it doesn't matter what race or ethnic group that you're talking about, it's got to be done by those people who are using the drugs. I mean, all of us in this room realize that much of the violence is caused by drugs. Um, what is it, 60 to 90 percent of, of violent drug offenders in the criminal justice system were placed there because they were using drugs at the time of the incident? Something like that? Most drugs, you know, violent crimes are, as it's being perpetrated, but people are not doing drugs. 
Crime not being perpetrated by people not doing drugs. We're talking about gang related. These kids, we learned that drugs bring down. It's not negative. Okay. If that's true, then we would have to include, we would have to conclude that there was a brain chemistry abnormality or a social impact that caused changes. Right. Social, a social environment could cause the brain chemistry. If there is brain chemistry change in that, I mean, there may not be any neurochemical changes in that particular situation. These are the types of things we have to discuss. You know, there, uh, where, where is the cause of the problem? I, I, I like to think that somebody around here knows what the causes of it, of it are, and there may be multiple causes, and we'll have to take care of each cause individually. But maybe there's a segment of causes out there that requires a drug therapy to change brain chemistry. That's what this is saying. I don't, I don't know if I agree with that or not. I'm just bringing up these ideas, because I don't profess to have any answers. Do you have your hand up, man? Yeah, I was just going to say, but aren't there... <coughs> Right. Yeah, and and let me clarify that that I'm not talking about drug-induced chemical changes in all cases here. There could be sociological changes, uh, causes. There could be psychological causes. There could be economic causes. A lot of different causes, and that's what makes it so difficult. But but there are some purists who are suggesting that maybe we ought to try to change brain chemistry in those violent sectors of our, of our public. We ought to change brain chemistry. And that's, that's a scary thought to me. Y even as a pharmacologist, that's scary to me. But it's something we're going to have to deal with because there are people out there talking about this, and it's a, an extension of this. Okay, well, let's, thanks for your input. Uh, I appreciate that. <clears throat> That's called cosmetic psychopharmacology. That's what Peter Kramer called it. And that, that has to do with, with uh, making everybody just a little bit better through pharmacology. Drug abuse might pre be prevented through cosmetic psychopharmacology. Could Prozac or other selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors reduce craving while correcting personality weaknesses? That's another extension of that. If so, would this reduce drinking and using and misuse and drug addiction? That's another extension of that. Finally, research can provide the breakthrough we need in overcoming public stigma about addictions. The public must be made aware of the difference between misuse and addiction, I believe. That's what I've tried to impact on you today in three hours, is if you believe what I've been talking about, please tell other people because Misuse is not the same as addiction. They're two separate issues that we have to deal with separately, and we can't get them mixed up. If addiction can be highlighted as a disease, then public support for treatment of and research on addiction will be more forthcoming. Um, I believe it was the Carter administration that almost wiped out psychosocial research in this country. And, and uh, I'm not a psychosocial researcher. I support all kinds of research. And unfortunately, however, this nation has a history of not supporting social research as well as medical research. One of the reasons why we want to highlight this as a disease, if we truly believe it is a disease, means that more money will be coming along for the treatment, for all, the funding of all of our programs. And that will help all of us to feel better on a day-to-day -day basis and help more people. Research will reduce emphasis on willful use, low willpower, flawed personality, and willful misconduct in drug addicts. Because the government has a history of supporting research on medical diseases compared to problems. This is the bottom line of everything I've been trying to talk to, to you about today. This idea about culpability. I believe that we should always hold people accountable for their behavior. But in some cases, w there will be less accountability for people who have a disease compared to a person who is willfully choosing to misuse a drug. And the criminal justice system is going to have to deal with that. I think we're already starting to see the beginnings of judges making decisions as to whether a person needs treatment in the criminal justice system or whether they need to be placed into an educational program. And I think that's a healthy sign that indicates that some judges are being able to uh, sort these issues out. Uh, the idea of culpability, even, even a person who's a diabetic, if they don't take their insulin and they, they uh, go into a coma and they pass out while driving and kill someone, they're still going to be held accountable, even though they have a disease. But uh, 
if they're, they're going to be held accountable for their treatment and they're going to help be held accountable for their behavior. But the culpability problem is going to be clarified as we go along and, and start to look at some of these issues I've been talking about today. Are there any final questions before I have my one final slide here today? Anything I haven't covered that you were happy, that you were uh, wondering about before we started? Okay. I like to close with my uh, quotation from Frederick the Great. The greatest and noblest pleasure which man can have in this world is to discover new truths, and the next is to shake off old prejudices. I hope you've, you've learned some new truths today and gotten rid of some of the prejudices that maybe you had. And if you have learned anything significant, be an educator and tell other people about it. Thanks for your interest. <laughs>